All right. Hello, Fortinos, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is December 4th, 2023, and we are in for a mind blower today. More incredible revelation, more incredible connections that we have all been seeking for years, that, that the church and, and others have been seeking for centuries. We are adding to it, brothers and sisters, just as we knew would happen. It's been happening for six years here in this ministry. It is the revelation of the end of days. And just as we've been saying over the last month or two, that more and more, greater detail of, of these tough things will start to reveal more and more and more here in this ministry, just as it has for six years. It only makes sense, right? If we keep diligent in the Lord, if we keep loving and, and strengthening each other, picking each other up and diligently seeking him, we will be as Enoch was as well. We will be rewarded. There is a pre-trib bride coming and there is a remnant of them who will remain to stay and work as well. And I've got something interesting on the enemy side as we get towards the end of this that's going to tie in. They're, they're the counter to what we are. They're the counter watchmen, but believe that they're the righteous watchmen. It's awesome. All of these connections, guys, it's incredible. And I want to let you know that this is one of those videos that you're going to want to spend some time in. Make, sh excuse me, make sure that you're getting it. Make sure that you're grasping it. Just like uh, one of the previous ones right here, the Beast of Revelation. That sucker was one we've been looking for a long time to understand. We can understand who the seven mountains are, where this portion comes from, uh, from, from Revelation 17 to Daniel chapter 7 and into 8, including 13. It's, it's incredible. But make sure you soak it in. Make sure you grasp it. Make sure you understand it. Because I believe what's going to continue to happen is this detail of things that within this ministry, we've been able to go through, <clears throat> excuse me, from Revelation 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and most of 14, all of it in order. We've got videos, which is, um, uh, the, the, I think, just something along the lines of just all of Revelation, like just all laid out. In fact, it's in the playlist, if I remember correctly. And I've, I've, you know, we've gotten parts and we've understood parts of Revelation 17. But when it comes to Mystery Babylon, when it comes to to how the ten horns are, are, are turning to Babylon, yet something happens to Babylon and the timing within the latter portion of 17, then going into 18 and 19, it's going to blow your mind because even though we've understood this this battle of 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 17 this this one battle which relates to the end of seals you're going to see something for the first time i believe um as far as i know it's never ever been understood before and that is the connection to the bulls to the to mystery babylon to the final battle in the wine press in revelation 19 but we're going to build it up to there it's going to be a mind blower. So it's everybody's responsibility to take the time and to diligently seek the Lord for yourselves. We're here. This ministry is to help reveal it, to bring about the understanding. And it's up to each and every one of us to dig into his word, to be diligent as Enoch was so that we can be rewarded as Enoch was. And that is the pre-trib bride of Christ ready, watching, and preparing because we are also a group preparing because as i believe as many as you as many of you know we i believe are a, are a good portion of the remnant worker bride as well not everybody okay you don't have to worry if you didn't want to stay don't worry about it but i believe that we are it, it never made sense to think that to think that the the lord would reveal and open his book reveal the mysteries of the end of days that had to happen before the end of days could begin and give his play look, playbook to the team. And then when the time comes, say, okay, team, you guys go home. I'm going to go show the other people what it all is to finish it up. It doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't make any sense. As in heaven, so on the earth, right? 
So it's up to every one of us to diligently seek. And we've got so many revelations here in this ministry that you could spend forever digging into them, going deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Because we go from the beginning of, of Genesis in the beginning to the end of the book of Revelation and all of it in between. I mean, it's been an incredible journey and I'm so excited. I can't wait to share this with you guys. It's awesome. For anybody that's new to the ministry or newer, you want to come to this playlist tab right here. In fact, if anybody was wondering, if you saw this last video here, it looks, okay, 10 days ago. Well, we did a live show a few days ago, and you're going to find that one right here. Sometimes when it's in the live show, a lot of people don't watch, don't know to, or, or go to the links. So the live show was right here, and that was just a few days ago. There was some really good info in there as well. So I would recommend if you haven't watched it, you can watch that one as well. So you want to remember to go check those out sometimes. And, you know, there's been today is day five going on to six. That's not normal for me. Usually it's every four to five days. And last night, because I had been digging diligently into all of these scriptures, because when this one was revealed and I was so pumped about it, I was like, oh, my goodness, I can't wait to see what's going to keep coming from this. And I've been spending hours and hours. This this is what I do. I am called to do what I'm doing. And so I've been spending days in this digging and and parts were coming and I was in chapters and, and books all throughout scripture. And as I was digging, I, I was starting to see stuff, but I just wasn't there. And I wasn't ready to do a video for you guys yesterday. So I said, no, I'm not going to do it. I got to spend more time. There's more coming here. Well, it was this afternoon, excuse me, at about four o'clock that it hit me. I'm reading through it and I'm pushing through. And then I jump to another part that I don't usually go into. Many people ask me about the bowls. We know the approximate time frame of the bowls. We've known it for a while. And because there's such a short period of time, I never spend all that much time in it. Well, hold on to your horses because when it dawned on me and I went to read it, it just all opened. And I was like, I had my finger out and something happens, right? When the spirit just comes in and it's leading and I'm seeing it and I'm reading it and I know what's happening. It's This is the way it's been happening for six years. And my daughter's coming downstairs to tell me something. I'm like, duh, 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 duh. and I, I'm going through it in my head. And because my wife wasn't home yet, I'm, I'm relating it to my daughter and I'm breaking it all down to her because it's always better when I hear it outside of my, you know, hear it in my own words and, and making it line up within uh, my thoughts. And then. I'm prepared to share it with you guys. And of course, picked up my wife and shared it with her. And I was all excited. And she's always such a supportive wife. Picked her up from work and she's like, you go, honey, you go teach it. <laughs> so it was great. Always get the encouragement from my wife. So with that, anybody that's new, you want to come to this playlist right here. This playlist right here, the Revealed End Time Study Note Series. Watch at least the first four videos. The first one is the intro. It's only 22 minutes. This one right here is an intro, and it's 22 minutes to lay the understanding of what you're about to hear in the following three videos. You can also go to ministryrevealed.com right here. This is the website. You can. We have a book that we wrote back in uh, 2020, I think it was, in March. You can get it on Amazon, ebook, or paperback, but you don't have to pay if you don't want to. You can download it in PDF in five languages. Just go to the link of the book page. You can listen to it in audio. We've got it all there available. If somebody wants paperback, then they can always go get paperback. But this is the website. And what you want to do is you want to come to the menu box here and click on the intro. This is the intro page here. And this is that first 22-minute video that will introduce you to the next three that are coming. This is the next one. This is the one that started it all. It's the, it's the revelation for what people have called contradictions and these differences within the Gospels, because there are clear contradictions. This is just a 30-minute intro to begin to reveal to you that the differences within the synoptic Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke reveal to us that the differences are prophecy for the end of days. And that they're speaking to different groups. Luke is to the pre-trib bride of Christ. Mark is to the sleeping church. The, the, the world, the house of Israel, and the Gentiles grafted in who aren't ready. But they will be part of the great mid-trib, great multitude rapture. 
And then Matthew, you'll see, is the years of trumpets. And when you begin to understand this and you see that there's these differences within the discourses, you will see that they're all speaking to different portions of time in the end of days. It is going to blow your mind. I promise you. This is a 30-minute Bible study, all with Scripture. Then you'll come to realize that the end of days is not seven years. It is 14 years. Luke's is a portion called above. That's 40 to 50 days. And Mark's is the seven years of seals. Matthew's is the seven years of trumpets. And you're going to say, how is that possible? How did we miss it? That cannot be. Well, I promise you, if you're in Christ spirit filled, this is a blessing for you because it means the pre-trib is seven years earlier than it would otherwise be if it was only seven years. You get it? But to understand, you're going to say, well, how is this possible? How was this missed? The answer is found in this video right here. It's about the other two were about 30 minutes long. This one is two hours and 45 minutes, and it is a bombshell. It's all because of Matthew. The answer is, as the title says, because for centuries, generation after generation, we've been taught foundationally from the gospel of Matthew. And the gospel of Matthew is not to us. Sure, all the Gospels are to everybody, but the real revelation within the Gospel of Matthew, which most people know, is that it is written to Judah. It is written to the Jews. What was never really understood is that Mark was written to Israel, to the world, right? The Gentiles grafted in, and Luke was written to the Gentile, the, the Gentile, that portion of the bride, <laughs> and it was never understood. When you watch this, after having watched the other ones, you're going to say, oh, my goodness. We have a, a new brother that came into the ministry. He's been sending me messages privately in, uh, in what we call our forum. I'll show it to you in a moment. And he said his jaw is just hanging down. He's got the book. He's been going through the videos, and he is just blown away. Because I promise you guys, anybody who's been looking to understand, especially the differences within the Gospels, and, and why this confusion You've come to the right place. The Spirit has led you, and I promise you, you're about to understand. Anybody that wants to join our forum, they could join us right here. Click on forum. There's about 1,200 people around the world. We're sharing news, events, uh, um, prayers, uh, uh, Bible studies, all sorts of things. And we're also always needing support for donations. And the reason we always are in need of support, I shared it in the forum the other day. Uh, and the reason for it, is we have our brothers and sisters in Uganda. Our brother Steve and his team in Uganda who are spreading the word. Thousands of people they've reached since we've started to help them. That we're, we're their only support, guys, in Uganda for Steve and his team. Uh, this is him right here. And we they have reached, with our help and support, thousands of people in Uganda for salvation in Christ. Thousands. And now they're being called by pastors all around Uganda. Dozens and dozens and dozens of them. And they're bringing Bibles. They have given out over 6,000 Bibles, which, by the way, cost them typically about $12 to $14 U.S. So consider how much that is. That's what, $70,000 U.S. just in Bibles that have been sent in the past year by sending the support and he buys them there. He can occasionally get deals, but generally not. And then we have not only the salvation, but bringing understanding from the Ministry Revealed book, which is what you saw happening here. They're printing the Ministry Revealed book in Uganda for us, and we are giving it to them as well. Not just giving it. We're teaching it. He's teaching it, him and his team. They're teaching it to people in Uganda who are receiving Christ so that not only are they saved and ready or are saved, but they're also being ready for the time that is near at hand. So we need to continue to finish this race in Uganda and continue to help support them. And you can do that by donating to our PayPal button here or our GoFundMe. Uh, if you want, you can see there's an address here. You address it to myself, and there's my shipping address. You can also find this info 
under the or in the description box under all of the videos. All the links are there as well. All right. Or you can even click right here and you'll notice these things pop up. The address is there. The website, PayPal, Facebook, Twitter, GoFundMe, it's all there as well. So right now we have uh, our sister Cindy, who is a very, very strong supporter of Steve and his ministry in Uganda. She just put up a um, a challenge of 700 U.S. that she's matching for those who would like to join in and help support Steve and his team in Uganda. As you could see, just from the books, like the Ministry Revealed book, He's been able to get it down to $4 each now because the printing owner is now part of the ministry and goes out and teaches with them from the Ministry Revealed book and the Salvation. It is absolutely beautiful what is happening there. And it, 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 just to be a part of it, guys, I am grateful, I'm honored, and we are all playing a part in support and in prayers. So if you can, if you're feeling led, if you're feeling it in your heart, please do so. And we will get that over to them right away. All right. When it comes to me through PayPal, it, us uh, it usually takes only one day. So within the following day, in the late afternoon, I could send it to them. And if it's GoFundMe, it takes about four, maybe five days before I receive it. And then I could send it to them. All right. So with that, brothers and sisters, let's get this party started. All right. I'm going to start right here first. after my sip of coffee. And the reason I want to start here is just this connection to the end of days. It was shared in the forum uh, just, uh, just a couple of days ago or so. And many of you guys will have seen it. Many of you guys will have heard it before. We've talked on it before in the past. And it's this letter that Albert Pike wrote. And apparently he wrote it to Massini in 1871. A lot of people, you know, it was claimed that it used to be in a museum in, uh, I think it was in London. But obviously, it's not there anymore. So a lot of people have debated whether this was real or not. You know, oh, it was probably written after World War II, and it was just a fake. Well, it went on to explain what World War I was, that they had planned three wars. Okay, he had written this to Massini. Albert Pike had written this to Massini. And it was the plan for World War I, which had to do with the czars of Russia and communism and so forth. Then it went to World War II. And it was that it would be fermented by the differences in the fascists and the political Zionists. Okay, of course, this was World War II. And we see that during the Second World War, international communism must become strong enough in order to balance Christendom, which would then be which would be then restrained and held in check until the time when we would need it for the final cataclysm. Okay. Very interesting stuff. And then this is World War III. Now, here's the thing. We've talked about this before, but what's described in World War III, we know that this is the case from Scripture. We understand this. We've known this. So if the third one is in line with the revelation of Scripture and is pointing to what's going to happen in World War III, then it kind of makes sense that this letter could very well be true in having written World War I and World War II correctly, seeing that the one that hasn't happened yet is the one we clearly know is going to happen. And that this Third World War is going to be between what? The Zionists and the Islamic world. And the whole world is going to be involved in this one. It says, then everywhere. So it'll start with the Arabs. It'll be the Arabs with against the Jews. We've taught this. We know this is exactly how it begins. We know northern Israel will be struck in Haifa and Tel Aviv. It'll settle down. Then it'll start. World War III will then officially begin with an attack on Jerusalem and destroy it. They will flee to the mountains. They will be in captivity and so forth. These are things we taught on. And then World War III will break out, even though that will officially be World War III breaking out. And it will be the whole world this time. It says, then everywhere, the citizens, the citizens obliged to defend themselves against the world minority of revolutionaries uh, will exterminate those destroyers of civilizations and the multitude disillusioned with Christianity. You see? 
and their spirits will be without compass and without direction. And then they would bring out their doctrine with Lucifer. Okay? All of these things we've been able to show and we've been able to understand. And this is prophetically written, apparently, back in the late 1800s. Why? Why prophetically? Because it was part of their plan. But you know what's great about this? They think it's their plan. We know it is part of the Lord God's plan. We can even prove it to this point of Lucifer because we know that Lucifer is connected to the time of seals in this portion of World War III. And when do we know that the Lucifer type with the beast, not Satan as we've shown, but Lucifer, and in fact, we're going to be able to touch on that in this video again, and we touched on it in the live show, so it's a great connection. We know that Lucifer and the false prophet, or the beast and the false prophet, the Antichrist, who is Lucifer in spirit, in this person, and the false prophet are there at the time after World War III. And this is what it's talking about. This is the World War III between the Islamic and the nations. Christians will be, will be beaten down. And then they're going to bring about this doctrine of Lucifer. Now, here's the whole thing. Is it all coming through the, the Roman portion? Is I don't think so. You see, a lot of people believe that it's this revived Roman Empire. Now, I'm not saying that this Rome typology isn't still going to play out in some portion. But we can prove, and I'm going to show it to you even in greater detail tonight, that we know that this Lucifer type is going to be an Arab. We all know it's going to be an Arab. And we've, we've been able to show these things by showing what was, is, shall be. Right? This is something we've shared many times, right? Ecclesiastes chapter 1-9. The thing that has been. So this is what we call the was. Is that which shall be. So is to come. And that which is, we call the is. So in that which is done, is that which shall be done. So you have what has been. Old Testament until Christ, you have what is, which is from Christ until the pre-trib, both of them give us typologies of what is to come. All right? And this is how we're able to discern these things through Scripture and, and reveal these connections. This, all of this right here, this brings us, this right here brings us to about two and a half years, not quite mid-tribulation of seals. Just from this. And we've proven it. We've been able to show it many, many times. And I'm going to show it to you today. Because at this point, which is mid-ish seals, about two and a half years in, is when Antichrist gets his power to continue for 42 months, as we shared before. Now, let me show you something in the was. I'm not going to go into this, but this was a video. It's just this. It's just audio. And it's uh, from Chuck Missler. I don't know how late it was. I don't know if it was early 2000s or what it was. But our brother now, Chuck Missler, is with the Lord. This, had, this, this was great. When I was listening to this, I was just pumped because what he does, and, and you see, a lot of the older school prophecy watchers that have been doing this for decades always have the focus on Rome. And you know why? Because Rome is the is. Rome is, is what happened during this period of the is that we're still living in. From Christ until the moment of the pre-trib, we're living in the is. So they always account it to be Rome as if it's going to be the same thing again. Now, that's not to say maybe Rome will have some play in it. I'm not going to dispute that. But the focus this time won't be Rome. It'll be Islam. You see, it's like in the Old Testament. In, in the was, it wasn't, it wasn't Rome, right? It was with Babylon, right? There was no Muslims yet, but it was through that Babylonian Arab world. And then in the is, they were against Christ, right? So you've got 
you've got this group fighting against Jews, you've got this group fighting against Christians, and in the end, you've got this group fighting against Jews and Christians. Because it's all now coming together. It will all replay out in typologies, like you've heard me say many times. These things that played out over like 2,500 years, and these things that played out over the last 2,000 years, in the end of days, they're going to play out over 50 days and 14 years. That's how incredibly devastating and, and crazy it's going to get. But to listen to this, as he played it out, as he was wording the events and things that took place through the Catholic Church and all of these things that they did over the past 2,000 years, it was awesome because my end time eyes, my end time understanding, I listened to it and you're just like, whoa. You, you could see what we've understood here in, in the is that we're still in because we're in the Laodicean age. And he's going through it. And like I've said before, these years aren't exact. It, they're in ranges. All right. And he's going through it. And it's it's like listening. Well, it literally is listening to everything that's part of the is. But my understanding is relating it to everything we've been showing from Scripture throughout the Gospels and other places in Scripture that reveal how those things in the is are going to be part of the is to come. And we're going to touch a little bit on the was and the is, and then show this stuff in the latter portion of the is to come. It is so awesome. And when I say awesome, I don't, I don't mean awesome because you want to be living through it. I mean awesome because the Lord, his spirit is leading and the Lord is opening our understandings. He is revealing himself in his is to come. And it's bringing clarity all the way back to the beginning of creation. And do you know what really caught my attention in the latter part of this? Check this out. Okay. Of course, that was the beginning. There was Smyrna, right? Remember Smyrna? They were 14ers, uh, right? They were 14thers. They were, they were, um, uh, um, Essenes, right? They were part of that group. They were part of the, the, the Nazarenes like Christ. No accusation against them. They became the disciple workers, right? That we've been talking about a lot. And then you keep going. And where are we? We are in the Laodicean age. And this is the reason, because we are in this age, and nobody in the church, even in prophecy, has ever fully understood the is to come of the seven churches, which we have revealed here. We have been able to show it and make it known. People don't realize that Laodicea is going to happen again. And so because we're in the Laodicean age of apostasy, they think that 2 Thessalonians 2 is going to play out in our day and age. When the, the temple is going to be rebuilt. Eventually, they're, they're going to they're gonna make a proclamation. And then you've got the mid-tribbers that will say, okay, it'll be about halfway tribulation. Then we're taken, and then he steps into the temple. No, that's not what's going to happen. Because when the pre-trib happens, the Laodicean age is over. At the pre-trib, it starts all over again with Ephesus and chapter 2, verse 1. Of revelation it will start all over again at the moment of the pre-trib escape it's so awesome it's so so exciting so um what else oh so what had happened in this is we're at, right now being in the laodicean age what really caught my attention is as Chuck Missler was going through all of this period of time, we saw the, the is, as most people understand, of the seven churches in their approximate year portions. And then it dawned on me. You see this one right here? We talk, we've talked about this one a number of times. Who is the typology of Constantine? Constantine was the typology of the future Antichrist, of, of, what, of what Albert Pike and those guys called the time for Lucifer. 
of what the end of days calls the time of the Antichrist. This is the time frame of Revelation chapter 13 when the beast gets his portion to continue 42 months. We've explained it many times. This is when they go after the Christians. This is Mark's discourse when they flee into the wilderness. Right? When they flee to the mountains, when they go to the wilderness, this is the time of Revelation 13. And then this continues the second half of seals. And then it goes to the Lord showing up, the time of Israel's kings, because the Lord is going to be here on heavenly Mount Zion. Okay? But we are where in this? We're in Laodicea. And we've been in Laodicea, give or take around 1900, until the moment of the pre-trib. What do we know is the time of Laodicea in the end of days? This is Antichrist coming on the scene, gets 42 months, goes through seals. And what happens at the seventh year of seals? The Lord comes on heavenly Mount Zion. Right? The great multitude rapture happens. The 144,000 are then sealed and will work during the first half of trumpets. And then will be given power to continue during the second half of trumpets. What happens in the second half of trumpets that we talk about all the time? It's at the fifth trumpet. It's at about 10 and a half years into tribulation. This covers the first 50-ish days, but also the first portion of seals. And this goes to when Antichrist gets his power. We know that when the Lord comes at the end of the sixth year of seals, Antichrist is killed the beast is killed but we know at about 10 and a half years in about seven years of seals and then about three and a half years into trumpets after the city and the streets had been rebuilt during the first half of trumpets messiah is cut off the pit is opened what happens when the pit is opened hello antichrist returns satan had been cast down the pit is open, and Antichrist, false prophet, and, and Satan, the dragon, are there. All of them together. What is this period of mid-trumpets? Satan wants to go after who? The Jews. Antichrist with false prophet is going after who? Christians. It'll start with this destruction and this attack on the Jews and scatter them. But there aren't that many Jews in the world. When he gets that power to continue for 42 months at mid-ish seals, or about two and a half years in, the Constantine type of Antichrist, who is the Muslim, the Muslim Mahdi, who is he going after? They're going after Christians. Antichrist against Christ. When Satan is cast down and the pit is open and Antichrist comes out of the pit, and the false prophet who wasn't killed, who's still there, who are they going after? They're going after the Jews. Well, consider this. This dawned on me when I was watching that video. In our Laodicean age, this is that period of about 2,000 years that we're still in right here. There were Here they were at the time of Constantine and going after the Christians. What happened in the 1900s with a group going after Jews. Hitler. Hitler, brothers and sisters. You see, they'll tell you, oh, Constantine and that persecution from Rome, they were a typology of the Antichrist. Yep. And Laodicea, Hitler was a typology of Antichrist. Yep. He was a typology of Antichrist in Satan's time. You see how credible that is? We've done this all the way through the is and the was. The was and the is. And the is in the video that Chuck Missler did was, was so clear to be able to follow and understand in what we know about the is to come over the 50 days and 14 years. Laodicea is the age we're in, and it was Hitler who went after the Jews. Laodicea, 10 and a half years into trumpets, the Christians are already gone. 
The great multitude rapture, the pre-trip happened, and the great multitude rapture happened. Who's he going after here? The Jews. It's a carbon copy, guys. It replays just as Hitler was in the time of Laodicea. So will Antichrist, when Satan is cast down and the pit is opened, go after the Jews. Again. It's incredible. It's so incredible to be able to follow this, guys. You see, this is what we see here, right? Whoops. So, whoops, missed it. So this is what we see, right? This is where we are right now. We are in this Laodicean age right now. Okay? We've talked about it before. We, we just did it in the recent video about naked and, and what naked is connected to, which is the end of tribulation. But the Laodicean age, it doesn't end at two and a half years, the last, uh, uh, the last half of trumpets. It's until the end of trumpets. You get it? So from ten and a half to the end, it's the Laodicean age. And we talked about this. We've broken it down. It's incredible. We showed the connection to why naked was there and why it was important to understand that it was in this church and not in the other churches. It's all directly connected. So now what I want to do is I'm going to show you some of these things where this connection is. And we've shared some of this before. Okay, A lot of this in the starting we've shared before. But you see, in the seven churches, we know that when it gets to Pergamos, the, or yeah, Pergamus, this is the period where we know that Antichrist is going to receive his power to continue. So this begins the 50 days. This begins the 40 days, which is eight days later. And all of this takes us to the end of the first about two and a half years of seals. When Antichrist in Revelation 13 gets his power to continue 42 months, when this happens, it's right here at Pergamum. What is that in the time frame in the end of days? It's right here. It's in the third year. Okay? For those that don't know, this is called chapters to years. In all of these books within the scriptures, we've been able to reveal these events that give us snippets of pictures of events that happen in the end of days that are directly connected and related it is absolutely incredible. And when you go to the intro series and you keep going further down, you'll come across the video chapters to years. <laughs> but definitely don't start there because you won't be able to follow it until you understand the timing of these differences within the Gospels. So there's that 50 days of, of the uh, uh, um, Ephesus and Smyrna. But their time, they're still going to remain during seals. Okay. But that period of when um, Pergamos starts is in the third year right here. Okay, in the third year of these chapters to years. Let me give you an example of why this is important and, and what it means. And I'll show it to you by going into two chapters. In Genesis chapter 10, so like you saw here, Gen uh, John chapter 10, and Genesis chapter 10 have a picture within them of what was shall be in the scriptures relating to the is to come at the end of days that puts it in this third year. Remember, when two years is complete, the very next day is in the third year. So it's about two and a half years in, which is halfway through the third year. Okay. And you see John's 21 chapters give us the same prophetic picture of the first 21 chapters of Genesis. It's really, really wild to see. But I'm going to show you one example of Pergamos and its connection to when the beast gets his power to continue for 42 months in John chapter 10 in Luke and Luke chapter 10. Listen to what it says. This is You'll see as this builds, you're going to want to bank this stuff as we continue to build it towards the end. But there's many things along the way. So in Genesis 10, verse 8, and Cush beget Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord 
Wherefore it was said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babylon, was Babel. And where was it? In the land of Shinar. Okay, that's all in that area of modern day Iraq. So we see this right here. Here he was building it up. It's all being built. You go into chapter 11. You see that it's all getting destroyed. They're about to all be scattered. Well, this is exactly what we show within right here. This is when Antichrist gets that power. And he's going to what? Build himself a place somewhere. And the exact connection to that time frame is in chapter 10, where we see the prophetic typology of Nimrod as the Antichrist, as many people will tell you in prophecy, is the prophetic picture of the Antichrist. And here he shows up building his kingdom, and it's Babylon. It's Babylon. Okay? Nimrod is a prophetic picture of the Antichrist at Middish Seals when he gets the power to continue for 42 months, and Babylon is being set up. Okay? You're going to want to remember that. Then we go to John. We go to John chapter 10, and look at what we read about in this prophetic picture of the Antichrist. We see the Lord here say in John 10 verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door unto the, into, into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Why is he explaining this? It says, on the stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him. Except for those that don't know. Now here it comes. John 10, verse 10. The thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that, I'm, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth life. For giveth his life for his sheep. But he is a hireling and not the shepherd whose own sheep are not, who, whose own the sheep are not. Seeth the wolf coming. Then seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth. And the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. You see what's going on here? This is exactly what we're talking about. Who is the wolf that scatters the sheep? Well, I was telling you that this mid portion right here, this prophetic picture of Antichrist getting his power here and building a place in Babylon. And we have John talking about the Antichrist as the wolf who's going to scatter the sheep. Do you know what happens at this point in seals? We're talking about Mark's discourse. We're at the point of Mark's discourse when you understand the differences in who the Gospels are speaking to, you're going to see it's this point right here. At the abomination of desolation, when they're to flee to the mountains. This standing where, at, where it ought not is not the same as the one in Matthew 24, which says standing in the holy place. This one is all about placing the mark of the beast. Standing or placing... You could see right here, to stand, to establish, to abide, or to place where it ought not. It's all about the mark of the beast. And you're going to see something we've talked about a number of times, but we're going to get back to this in a moment in relation to the discourses to be able to see this connection as to why at this point we then suddenly see false Christs and false prophets. But going from Luke into Mark, we don't see it until this point when the mark of the beast comes. It's very important. So where is that? All of that is directly connected within these chapters, or what we call chapters to years, which is about two and a half years in. So what's happening during these first two and a half years? What's happening during these first two and a half years? World War III. World War III. They're going to make the whole world so devastated, so beaten up, so disillusioned with Christianity. And then they're going to manifest Lucifer, the doctrine of Lucifer. That's what's coming. 
this all brings us, this is why I wanted to show this. This all brings us to this point of Middish seals right here reflected exactly in our chapters to years portions of time. It's, it's so wild to see it play out and come together. So here we are now. This brings us to Revelation chapter 13. And I want to show you guys something. I, it, I never caught this before. Now, I may have caught a piece of it before, but I never caught the connection into Daniel before. You see, we've all heard this, haven't we? Thir uh, Revelation 13, verse 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise out of the sea. Okay? This beast, we'll, we'll cover it in, um, in Daniel, but this beast is the system, guys. Okay? This beast is the Antichrist's dominion. This beast that comes out of the sea has seven heads and ten horns. This is his kingdom. Okay? The beast, the heads, and the horns are his kingdom. How do we know this? Well, if we go to Daniel chapter 7, we'll see this. This isn't what I was getting to, but this is part of it. You'll see it right here. Uh, right here. In Daniel 7, 23, thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. Okay, and shall tread and break down in pieces and so forth. So the fourth beast is the kingdom. Now, many people would say, well, we know that. I agree. That wasn't the part I was getting to, but I wanted to show that so that people can understand the entirety of the kingdom is the beast, the seven heads, and the ten horns. Now, one of the questions had been, what are the ten horns? You see, we've been able to reveal the understanding of the seven heads. We know they're all Arab. But does that mean that the ten horns are all Arab? And I'm going to tell you, I do not believe, I was leaning until yesterday today, believing that they were probably also only Arab. But I don't believe so anymore. I'm going to show it to you in, in, um, uh, uh, in what we're going to see in relation to what the, the Muslims' words tell them. But we'll also see it in Revelation as we go into 17, 18, and so forth. We could see that they're actually not just Arab. They're going to be the ten horns that are going to be ten kings throughout nations, not just in the Arab world. Okay, But the whole thing is his kingdom, and he's going to have kingdom and dominion over the earth, right? So check this out. This first beast, okay, comes out of the sea. Well, what about the other beast? Revelation 13, 11, and I beheld another beast coming out of the earth. Well, that's interesting, right? One coming out of one coming out of the sea, one coming out of the earth. And we know that the one that comes out of the sea is, is the entire system coming into power, which is the Arab Muslim system that will take over, just as you saw, they wanted to ferment in World War III. But the beast doesn't stand up to get this power at the beginning of World War III. It's not until after World War III, which is about two and a half years, which is why the beast... It says, then continues for 42 months with that little horn, as we revealed, who's the one really causing all the trouble. You know, I chuckle because you always see it's this little horn coming up from the ten, and he's the one. He's the mouthy one causing all this trouble and making war against the saints. But we saw one came out of the sea, and one came out of the earth. Now, this was important because we shared this not too long ago in, uh, in another great video. If For anybody who hasn't seen it yet, you want to watch this one. Ancient Scrolls Prophetically Proven. It's a gangbuster of a video. So what we end up seeing 
is, oops, in Second Baruch, when we talked about it, it's right here. Um, in Second Baruch 29, verse 4. And Bohemoth will be revealed from its place, which is earth, you're going to find out. And Leviathan will arise from the sea. Those two great monsters, which I created in the fifth day of creation. Why is this a big deal to us? Well, we shared it before. The reason this is a big deal is because God said he created them in the fifth day. Why does that matter that they were created in the fifth day? Because the days of creation are the days of seven days, which to us would have been as 7,000 years. We've taught on it many times. And then from Adam forward are the 7,000 years we're living in in time. But to the Lord, there's still days. That's why 2 Peter 3.8 told us that. So it's telling us that in the midst of the creation of days, he created Leviathan and Bohemoth, one out of the earth and one out of the sea. And when are they going to come? When is their portion being played out? In the midst of seals, the portion that's days as thousands and in the end of days is years. And then this is the creation of Adam and the 7,000 years that we're in that are days to the father and the seven years of trumpets. It's a mind blower. If you're new, just go watch that intro series on the website and follow it video by video by video right to the end. And when you get to that final video, you'll see what I'm talking about. So the fact that they show up in the midst of seals is extremely, extremely important. But what did we see? One from the sea, one from the earth. Well, look what happens when we go to Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, we see in verse 3, And four great beasts, listen to this, came up from the sea came up from the sea. Four beasts came up from the sea. Watch this. Then we get the explanation, right? Daniel gets the interpretation. And listen to what Daniel 7:17 7, says. These great beasts, which are four, okay? These great beasts, which are four, that came up out of the sea. No, wait a second. These great beasts, which are four, are four kings, which shall arise out of the earth. Which shall arise out of the earth. So you've got the kingdom out of the sea. And you've got <clears throat> the kings that are over them out of the earth. Okay. So there's still a king in the, in the beast. And there's the, 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 there's the one from the sea and the one from the earth. It's, it's, Wild to be able to see and to start piecing these things together. Because when you understand this, now, this is something that is understood in Revelation 13 already. We know that this second beast that comes out of the earth, we know that this is the false prophet. Okay? It's not a, it's not a mystery. It's not hard to understand. But we know that this one is a false prophet. And what are these beasts connected to? Bohemoth and Leviathan. Mid-seals because they were created in the middle of the days of creation. And what does he do? He does wonders in the sight, right? He has to be in the presence, okay, of the first beast, which is literally before him, okay? In the sight of, in the presence of him, he can do these signs and wonders to really get people convinced. And we know for a fact that this is the false prophet, <clears throat> because in Revelation 19, which we are going to get to again at the end, we see when they're in Revelation 19, verse 20, we see it says, and the beast that was, uh, that was taken, sorry, and the beast was taken, and with them the false prophet that brought miracles with them, which deceived, uh, which he deceived, to them that receive the beast, uh, uh, the, the mark of the beast, worship the image, and so forth. So it's not difficult to understand 
that Revelation 13, <clears throat> the first one is the Antichrist beast, and the second beast is clearly the false prophet. One coming out of the sea, one coming out of the earth. When we go to Daniel um, chapter 7 again, we see in chapter 7 that there were four, right? Four out of the sea, four out of the earth. We've explained many times that the lion is what we've explained here in Jeremiah, that the lion, the bear, and the leopard are the first three and uh, two and a half years of seals that we've been talking about. Okay. This first two and a half approximate years is the first three. Okay. They're the first three. Here's disaster from the north coming against Judah and Jerusalem. This is when Syria the lion in Jeremiah 4, verse 7, the lion is coming up from his thicket and the destroyer of the Gentiles, this is the bear, is on his way. Okay? What is he coming? He's about to destroy Jerusalem. They all freak out. Make uh, Verse 16, make you mention to the nations, behold, publish in Jerusalem that watchers, you see? Watchers, look at that. Netzar, you know why? Because it's the Hebrew for the Nazarene. The hidden ones, the watchers. This is probably, brothers and sisters, this is most likely, almost certainly, connected to the watchmen, disciples, that we've been talking about when they're here with the Son of Man for 40 days. This is what's happening. So it says, Make ye mention to the nations, Behold, publish against Jerusalem that watchers come from a far country and give out their voice against the cities of Judah. As keepers of a field, are they against her roundabout? Because she has been rebellious against the Lord. Remember what happens in Luke? In Luke chapter 21, we know that the Son of Man is here for 40 days. And while he's here for 40 days, he is going to warn. He's going to do as Jonah did. Because we know that the, the three events of Jonah in Luke, Mark, and Matthew were prophetic and have not yet happened. Jesus did not warn, as Jonah did yet, for 40 days that they were going to be attacked and destroyed. He didn't do that for 40 days at his resurrection, but everybody will tell you that he did, only because they don't yet have the revelation of the end of days. So what, is he, what do you see here? This is Jesus talking about it. And when, in Luke 21, verse 20, starting in verse 20, and when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. This is the revelation of the is to come about it. That the desolation is nigh. Let them that be in Judea flee to the mountains and let them which are in the midst depart out and let not them that are in the countries enter there into. For these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Woe to them that are with child and those that give suck in those days. This is now the beginning of it all. He's warning before it happens. When his 40 days are over in that 40 in that 50 day portion above the 14, he's warning during the 40 days. And who is he doing it with? He's doing it with the Luke group. He's doing it with that remnant worker Luke for uh, um Luke group who are that remnant bride portion we've been talking about. And and who have we been showing over the last several videos that they are? They're watchmen. They're watchmen. They're the Nazarene. They're, they're watchmen. The Hebrew right there. They're the ones with the Lord who are following him, who will have that meal with them, be with him for 40 days. And when the 40 days of the Son of Man is over, they're over, he's gone. And in three days, the, this group of, watcher, of watchmen will receive the anointing of the Holy Ghost and what we call Acts 2.0 go out from Jerusalem, and Jerusalem will be attacked and destroyed. So there they are, all being warned. People coming from a far country. And then what? The sound of the trumpet. Why the sound of the trumpet? Because it happens for war, yes. But also because it will be at the Feast of Trumpets. And I believe this is all pertaining to next year. 
You guys know this. We've spoken about it before. Destruction upon destruction is cried. For the whole land is spoiled. Suddenly are my tents spoiled and my curtains in a moment. How long shall we see the standard and hear the trumpet? Okay. They're going to be destroyed. But then the Lord says uh, in verse 22 of Jeremiah 4, uh, verse 27, for thus saith the Lord, uh, for thus hath the Lord said, the whole land shall be desolate, yet I will not make a full end. Right? We know it's not going to be a full end because they're going to be brought back eventually. But it's because the Lord, something we haven't spoken about in a while, but we know that Jerusalem must be at rest for seven years. Only a small group will come back to be allowed to rebuild the foundation. But all of Jerusalem is going to say, no, thanks. They don't want to go back. They're already experiencing this war and the chaos of it. Then tens of millions of people are going to vanish. Haifa and Tel Aviv are going to be destroyed. Then 50 days later, Jerusalem is going to be attacked and destroyed. They're going to say, no, thanks, no more. And they're gone. Only a small group will be brought back to begin to rebuild. But it won't last, as we know. It will only be the foundation laid. So we see this warning that we saw from Luke 21. We see this warning of these events that are taking place from Luke chapter 21. And bro, give me a second here. And so in Daniel 7, when we see these four beasts, it's the lion first. This is that lion from Jeremiah who is going to bring about the destruction of Jerusalem. He's going to be uplifted and everybody's going to be like, whoa, because all the Muslims want Jerusalem wiped out, right? They want the, the Jews out of there. And then what happens? The bear, Russia, that's the, the one who's coming up uh, um, to destroy the Gentiles, the destroyer of the Gentiles. Then you have the leopard. I've explained it before. I think through the World Economic Forum and that group, that's probably the entire group connected as this new modern day, if you will, Roman Empire. That's why you could see the dominion going given to it. This is going to be the control center. This is going to be where the, the mark of the beast is established, where they're, they're, they're about to release it. This is why we see them preparing and putting all of these things in order right now. Because it's through them that all of this is going to come about. The first one is war against Jerusalem. The second one is war in, around the world. And that towards that, that latter end of the first two and a half years, they're going to have this dominion where all of the control center throughout World War III is going to be held through here. Then the fourth beast. This is the fourth beast. And you'll notice that this fourth beast, it says nothing about seven heads anymore. It's only the ten horns. Why? Because this beast is the eighth of the seventh head. Okay? There were seven mountains, seven heads. He is the eighth who is of the seven. And we've explained that in uh, Daniel chapter 8. I don't want to go through all of it, but just to show you guys, we can see it right here. We saw the, the first one was in the first year. We see here in the third year. How fitting is that, right? Watch this. Right here in the first year of Belshazzar, and it's in Babylon. And here we have, right, that's from the, from the was, and now you have the third year. And he's being explained it. And then what do we see? You had the two, uh, you had the ram that had the two horns. So anybody that's new, you want to go watch the, 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 the beast video. But these horns are not the same. These are called the mountains. That's why there are seven of them. There's two, then there's one, and the one destroys the two, which is Media Persia. And then this one, the third one, his horn breaks. And when his horn is broken, four come up, four notable ones come up towards the four winds. That makes seven. And then out of one of them is this little horn. This isn't the little horn as we've shared from Daniel 7. This is the little horn who is the eighth who is of the seventh. And this is the one who waxed great and does all this stuff. This is 
the beast. This is the one who has the ten horns. That's why when you see over here, there's no mention. And all of these, all of those seven and to the eighth, they were all Arab, right? Media, Persia, and let me show you this. Media, Persia, and let me show you why people get it still confused thinking Rome because of what happened through um, um, right through all that with Alexander the Great and everything. When you get the interpretation of the vision, it tells you that it was Media and Persia, and then the rough goat was Grisha. And when Grisha's is broken and four stood up for it, you'll hear somebody, like I said before, you'll hear these, these old prophecy teachers that, and I, what I mean by old is just they've been doing it for a long time, will tell you that it's the revived Roman Empire because it's Grisha. But Grisha is the is of what happened. There's the was, there's the is, and there's the is to come. What is the is to come of Grisha? It's the reason right here it says, also a place in Arabia. Because in the end of days, it is all connected to Arabia. And that's something you're going to start to see more and more uh, revealed here tonight. That it's all connected to Arabia. So when these four come up and then that final one, this one speaking dark sentences, that is the little horn who is the eighth. Okay? So this is why in Revelation 7, I mean in Daniel 7, this fourth beast who has ten horns, he doesn't have the seven heads anymore because the seven heads are gone and he is the eighth who is of the seven. That's what we got the description of in Daniel chapter 8. And these other three beasts from the lion, the bear, and the leopard, they're beasts. They're not heads. They're beasts. And they don't die when the Lord comes at mid, at the end of uh, six years of seals when he comes on heavenly Mount Zion. You see, we saw this and we spoke about this last time as well. Now we're in Daniel 7 and the little horn is no longer mountain. It's literally the cornet and a horn. So this eighth mountain who is of the seven, as we saw from Revelation 17, we see it right here when we're told that the woman drunken on the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. Remember, this is all prophetic for the end of days. When people see this, they still think Rome. And they somehow this revived Roman Empire. It's always been a difficult thing to understand. Whether people would say it's America, whether they would say it's Rome, whether they would say, you know, somewhere in Arabia or elsewhere. It, it is through the Muslims. It is going to be Arab. But you could say that the, the Roman portion, if you will, is probably that European portion and the leopard and so forth. They're all in it together. They're going to be the control system for him. But you see, it tells you right here, I'm going to tell you the mystery of the woman, the ten, the ten horns, and of the beast. Okay? And what do we see in Revelation 17, 9? The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Okay? Seven heads are seven mountains. Well, what were the seven mountains or the seven horns in Daniel 8? Seven of which what? There's the eighth, right? Where is it? See? So there was seven, but he is the eighth. And he is of the seven. That's what Daniel 8 revealed to us a couple videos, two, three videos ago. It was so exciting to be able to put this together. But now we've got more and more building. You see, because now we're able to see this connection in Daniel 7 to those that came up from the sea and the others that came up from the earth. So what means is that this fourth beast, who is the eighth of the seven, is also going to be working, as it said, with the beast. So it says the four 
kings that arise out of the earth, which is connected to the false prophet as well. So the other thing to make note of is this little horn. I want you guys to take note of, though, of who gets killed. Watch this. Take note of who gets killed. Uh, I then considered the horns, and another little one came up, plucked up three, uh, and was given a mouth speaking great things. So at the time of the fourth beast, who is the eighth of the seven, who are Arab, that we can show through Media, Persia, and uh, Arabia, that the the little that the the one goat is Arabia, and the four that come from it are Arabia. And then one more comes from among that from that seventh, who is of the seventh, who becomes the eighth, that little horn mountain, is all Arabia. So you've got Media, Persia, and the rest of them are Arabia. Now you've got the ten horns, and this other little one comes up speaking great things. We shared in the previous video as well with the beast how Revelation 13 says the same thing. But now look what happens. The Ancient of Days does come. This is the end of six years of seals. Uh, a thousand, thousand ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. Uh, the judgment was set. The books were open. I beheld then because of the voice of the, great uh, of the great words which the horn spake. So again, it's the horn speaking all these words. And I beheld even till, listen to this, the beast was slain. So the beast was killed. Okay, the Antichrist here is killed and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and time. Well, who are the other beasts? The first three, the lion, Syria, the bear, Russia, and the leopard through Europe. They, had their, they, they were given extra time. Their dominions were taken away. But only out of that leadership, not even the little horn was killed, but the beast was killed. We know that this is the Ezekiel 39 war. It's a big battle that's going to take place, right? This is that period of time. And then you get the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven to the Ancient of Days. Dominion is given to him, exactly as we know happens at the end of the sixth seal. The Lord is there on heavenly Mount Zion. He, then you have the seventh year of seals, and then the first year of trumpets begins the rebuilding of the city in, in the streets, and we're going to talk about that in a bit as well. But look at the interpretation. Here you are, arise out of the earth, and then it says, uh, take the kingdom of the most high. Verse 20, Daniel 7, verse 20. And of the ten horns that were in the head, and the other that came up before, which three fell, even that horn that had eyes and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. Because again, the ten horns are ten kings as well, right? I beheld, and the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them until the Ancient of Days came and possessed the kingdom. Okay? So who's the one making this war against the saints? It's this little horn, not the mountain horn. It's, it's the little horn that came up after, the cornet. He's the one making this war against the saints. And then it says, of course, at the end, this when the saints are going to possess the kingdom, this is the great multitude mid-trib rapture. It tells us then that the fourth beast is the fourth, fourth kingdom on the earth. It'll be more, uh, um, it'll be diverse from the rest. It'll tread, it'll be terrible, and look, shall devour the whole earth because he's going to have power and control over the whole earth. And this is what the Mahdi for the Muslims is going to have. The ten horns out of his kingdom are ten kings, but they're out of his kingdom. But where's his kingdom? His kingdom is going to be the whole earth. Right? He's going to have, it'll be the mark of the beast. Right? It'll be to everybody, man, woman, child, young, old, rich, poor. It'll be the time when they flee into the wilderness. And this is all about the 42 months 
This is his 42 months that he has to tread down and break them and all of that other stuff. And then we see, uh, da, 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 da. and then the one again, speak great words against the Most High, shall wear out the saints of the Most High and think to change times and laws and shall be given unto, the, unto his hand until the dividing of time. Who is this? This is that little bugger. This is that little horn. It's the little horn that speaks the great words. It's the little horn that goes after the uh, uh, the Christians, goes after the saints. It's the little horn that goes to change times and laws. The beast overall is, is the system of, of, yes, the Antichrist, because he's the beast, over control over all of it, but he's got this one little bugger that's really causing the chaos. And as we've shared before, until what? Until a time end times and the dividing of time a lot of people think this means the same thing as as daniel 12 and the same as revelation 12 verse 14 but it doesn't you see it's only used one time this dividing of time is the end of seals and a lot of people most people haven't understood that it's it's going to be now why dividing of time the reason for the word dividing of time is because the age of the Gentiles is over. It's over. It's finished. Okay? How do we know this? Because this is the mid-trib great multitude rapture. It is the end of the church age, the, the house of Israel and the Gentiles grafted in. At the great multitude rapture, it's over, and it now turns back to the time of Judah, to the Jews. So what happens to this little horn? But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume it and to destroy it unto the end. See that? So, again, his dominion is taken away, but his judgment, his, his death doesn't happen yet. So, we know that there is the Ezekiel 39 war at the end of that, that tail end of the sixth year of, of uh, seals. And we know the beast is killed there. We can see that all here. We can see that he was um, uh, um, that he was the seven uh, that he's the eighth of the seventh. We could see his ten horns, and the reason, as we said in the previous video, <coughs> the reason that the heads aren't mentioned anymore is because this is the point when the heads are given their crowns. You see, and upon the ten horns, ten crowns. So there's ten crowns, which means. All the, the seven heads portion that came before are all done. It's now the time of the eighth, which is of the seven. And when we went to Revelation 17, we can now start to put this all together a lot better. We see the woman, by the way, which we're going to get to, who is Babylon. And we see that she's in, check it out, wilderness, right? In a wilderness, in a desolate or desolate area, right? where he was carried away, but she's covered in what? Uh, she wears purple and scarlet, which means Babylon is here during the time of Mark's seven years and Matthew's trumpet's time because she's decked in purple and scarlet. This is part, if you're new and you watch that first 30, like the second video, but the first 30-minute video on the differences of the Gospels, you're going to see that in Luke, Jesus was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, which means white, radiant, and beautiful. That's the pre-trib Gentile bride of Christ. Then you see in Mark that he was arrayed in, Jesus going to the cross was arrayed in purple. Then you go to Matthew and you see that he was arrayed in scarlet. And what are the two tribulation colors? Purple and scarlet. <clears throat> and so there's the woman, Mystery Babylon, over purple and scarlet. But the question has been, where, when is Mystery Babylon destroyed? And that is what's coming, guys. We're going to keep building to it. We're going to keep building to it <clears throat> because it's awesome. So um, so now we're going to see the woman here in a little bit, but we see the seven heads and the ten horns that the beast has. So remember, the beast in the system is the seven heads and ten horns. When the seven heads are gone, 
then you would think, well, it's dead. Well, no, because that eighth one comes of the seventh. And that's that little horn, which is the little horn mountain in Daniel 8. He is now the representation of the beast now. The other seven heads are gone. He is now the eighth of the seven. And that's why in Daniel 7, you didn't see any mention of heads anymore because he is the eighth of the seventh. That's why Daniel 8 explains there's the eighth of the seven. And that's why he only had the, <clears throat> the ten horns. And that's why in Daniel, uh, in Revelation 13, you see the mention of the heads, but now there's only the crowns on the, um, on the ten horns and no longer on the heads. Okay? This is the understanding of it. And so when we see something like this in Revelation 17, 6, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, and I saw her and wondered with great admiration. You see, it's easy to think revived Roman Empire, like I've been saying. But it's not. This is end of days prophecy. This is not is. This is is to come. So this woman who's riding this beast, who is, the woman is Mystery Babylon, is the one who is connected to mid-seals time, right? This, this is why I was showing you <clears throat> the connection with John, uh, uh, with John and Genesis chapter 10. Babylon. Mystery Babylon is established. The, the, the wolf, the, the Antichrist, come in to steal and cheat and scatter them and kill them. Because it's directly connected to Babylon, who is the woman, and she is the one responsible as this woman, as Mystery Babylon, for the destruction of the saints and so forth, who is what? It's all from the Muslims. It's the Muslims' period of time. The is was Rome. There is no great Roman army. People will try to tell us, oh, uh, uh, America, the great Roman army, is going to turn on all the Christians in their own land and kill them all. Seriously? You ever wonder why so many millions of people are flooding into the U.S.? Military-aged men by the thousands every day into the U.S. and into other countries all around the world? You ever wonder? Because the time's coming. Right? They behead people. What's happening to the Christians in the end of days? They're being beheaded. The American military isn't going to turn on its own people like that. Oh, sure, people will turn on people. People will turn people in. But they're not going to be executing Christians in their own nation and their neighbors. They'll be turning them in for their own survival if they're not in Christ. But the ones in Christ, we know can't. Right? That's the patience of the saints. So, and, and in fact, let me just jump over there for one second. You see, this is why you have the patience of the saints. And, and what did it say in Daniel chapter 7? Then all the saints, right? They'll be with the Lord and everything else. So, if this was supposed to be after that time, then why would it say, you see, when he goes after the saints and it was given to him to make war with the saints? Who's the one making war with the saints? Well, it says right here, Revelation 13, 6. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God and to blaspheme his name and his the tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. You see? This, this is precisely what we were told that little horn, cornet horn, would do from among the ten. That then came up. He's that mouth speaking all these things and goes after the saints. And it says to overcome them, and power is given him over all kindred and tongue and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, Slain from the foundation of the world. Now listen to this. This is the important part. 13.10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword 
must be killed with the sword. Okay? If people are riding out on their neighbors, they're going to end up in captivity. If they're leading other people to the sword, they're going to be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and faith of the saints. See what's going on here? This is all that connection to Daniel chapter 7 when that beast gets that, uh, when the beast shows up and that little horn shows up and then you have the, anti, uh, the false prophet then show up. Okay? This is what we see happening. So now we go back to 17 and it's all Muslim based. And it just so happens the Muslims have their Mahdi and their prophet. Okay? They have the two that are there. And so when we come back over here in Revelation 17, to understand this and break this down more, we're going to get into the woman, as I said. Don't worry about the woman yet. We're going to get into her. But for those that were looking for, for the rest of it, okay, we know uh, the beast. And okay, and here's the beast. The beast that's, that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. You see, this isn't a mystery for us. We know that he was, is not, and shall be. So if, if Revelation chapter 13 just showed that he was going to be there for 42 months, and it was going to be after Daniel 7 showed it was going to be the lion, then the bear, then the leopard, and then when he shows up, he's going to have the power, because now he's going to have control and power over the whole earth, that everybody should worship him as you'll see the Muslims say about their guy, we now see that all of it is under his control. But those other three at the end of seals aren't going to be killed. Only the beast is. Right? Only the beast is. And that's why he was for the second half of seals. <laughs> he is not for the first half of trumpets and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. This is what I was telling you guys about earlier that so many people have failed to understand because how can anybody understand was, is not, and shall be? How can anybody understand that over a seven-year tribulation? It's literally impossible. Ask that about anybody. I would love to hear what people have to say in their seven-year thinking of it. It's literally impossible, 100% impossible. And so this is why I was saying at the beginning, when you come to 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, starting in verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. And because the falling away is apostasy, they know that this is the time of Laodicea. And so that's why they think before we can go, there has to be the son of perdition. What they haven't realized is the connection to it in the end of days is, yes, as we're in the Laodicean age, we are in this age of falling away. As we're in the Laodicean age, we had a Hitler who was like an antichrist with Satan going after the Jews. And it just so happened that what, what happened after? The Jews were brought back into their land. Isn't that exactly what we teach as a little side note? Isn't that exactly what we show that happens? Satan's cast down, as I was saying earlier. He gets two and a half years to go after them and all the craziness. Then it's the day of the Lord and the year of his vengeance. And then what? They're all brought back into their land. It's like a prophetic picture of, of what was with, Satan, uh, with, uh, with uh, Hitler destroying and going after the Jews. And then bang, they get to go back into their land. You see, nothing new under the sun. So... We are. This is something that has happened. But there is the prophetic is to come. And this is the prophetic is to come that's being spoken about. And how do we know it? Because the son of perdition, we're told, is the one who was, who was, then is not, and then shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. It's not from was, is, and is to come. These are all three things that will play out in the end of days because it's the beast. The beast that had seven heads and became the eighth. 
And what does he do? Exalt himself above everything that is God. And you see, this is the is to come of Laodicea apostasy, which is that midpoint of trumpets that we were talking about in the beginning. <clears throat> Let's go back to Revelation 17. So now you're starting to see this. We can explain with clarity the beast now. We've understood this portion for a long time. But now we can understand how he had seven heads and that the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And a lot of people say, well, see, that has to be Rome. And we know that he's also what? He's not the seventh, but he's the eighth who is of the seven and ends up going also into perdition. So we know it's this beast going into perdition who goes into the who goes into hell when when Satan is cast down, it's open, which is the fifth trumpet comes back. Okay? So look at what happens now. I want you to see this. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. Seven kings, five are fallen, one is and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must come a short space. Okay? That's your seven. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth. Which means, see? The beast who is the eighth is the one from the was, then he is not, and then he is the one that's also going into perdition. This is why, as I said, in Daniel 7, there was no mention of heads anymore because he was the eighth of the seventh. Daniel 8 explained it. This is why in Revelation 13, the crowns are now on the horns because those other heads are no longer there. He is the eighth. You see what's going on? So let me show you something about this. I thought this was very interesting. Now, I'm not saying this is the place, but I want to show it to you. Listen to this. I've never heard of this before. And I can't remember, if, I think it was shared in the forum. Want to dine out but not sure where to go? Here. Use Open Table. Simply type in what you're looking for. I had never heard this before. And I don't, I think it was shared, in, yeah, it was shared in the forum. Listen to this. Okay, this is from an Islamic uh, channel. So the Mecca city is surrounded by seven large mountains that have long Islamic history. See that? There are seven mountains that all face, that all surround Mecca. Check it out. Mount Habuk Bays. This mountain is located directly opposite the Kaaba Sudi building, near the mountain Zafa. This mountain is considered one of the pillars of the holy city, has witnessed many Islamic events, one of which is the rediscovery of Hajar al-Aswad by Prophet Ibrahim, after it was lost in the time of the Prophet Nu. Jabal Thabir. Thabir mountain is located east of the city of Mecca. According to some historians, this mountain is the mountain where the scapegoat was sent at the time of Prophet Ibrahim to sacrifice Prophet Ismail. Jabal Thor. This mountain is where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his companion Abu Bakr, sought refuge when they migrated from Mecca to Medina. Thor Mountain is located about three kilometers from the Grand Mosque. Jabal Kandama. Mount Kandama is located behind the Abu Qubay's mountain in Mecca. If you are standing at this mountain, you can see beautiful views of the entire holy city of Mecca. Mount Gwakian. Gwakian Mountain is located west of Masjid al-Haram. This mountain has several historical meanings. One of the most attached is the name of this mountain, Gwakian, which is taken like the sound of clanking swords during the Battle of the Jaw Um and Kataruant tribes. Jabal Omar. The Jabal Omar is located west of the Masjid al-Haram. Many pilgrims live in the hotel and apartment in the Jabal Omar area, as its location is close to the Holy Mosque. Jabal al-Nur. Jabal al-Nur, known as the Mountain of Light, stretches in Makkah's Hejazi area. One of the historical areas in Jabal Nur is the Hira Cave, where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, received the first revelation from Allah through the angel Jibril, in the form of five verses of Zura al alaq Jabal Nur is one of the most visited Sierra places in Mecca. There you go. I had never heard about that before. I don't know if you guys have, but for me, it was definitely something new. So I wanted to share that with you because, you see, there's what? Seven mountains. So we've all been told, like, I'm sure all of you have heard in prophecy that the seven mountains are the seven mountains in Rome or that there are seven hills in in uh, um, in Washington. Right. That that all of it is set is set upon. Maybe there's a connection to all of it. 
But remember, this is all Arab. And Mecca is the place where their Mahdi guy is slated to come to. So it makes sense that these are the seven mountains. But am I saying, is that the only option? No, I wanted to show that to you as another possibility, because you guys probably never heard of it, as I never had. Because generally, as Christians, we stay away from, from the stuff that the enemy has, and of course we do, but we can learn by what their prophecies are telling them and counter them by showing what ours are. And when you understand what we understand, oh my goodness, does it ever make so much more sense? It just, it it shows it all. And I don't mean more sense like theirs gives ours more sense. It just confirms and clarifies and shows that these things are directly in line. Not a Roman Empire, but the time of the Muslims. So what else does it say? There's seven kings, and then there's going to be the eighth of the seven. Well, let me show you this. Did you guys know this? Let me see. I want to make sure I got the right one. Now, again, am I saying that this is it and he is the eighth? No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying have a look at this, just like we did with the mountains. Remember, we're talking about what? Kingdoms. Kingdoms. Right? All throughout Scripture with the prophecy, it's the kingdoms. So we've got clear kingdoms in the end of days that are already here. So the first Saudi king, to use the title, was Fasel. However, King Khalid did not use the title uh, after him. You're going to see what I'm talking about. In 1986, King Fa replaced his majesty with the title custodian of the two holy mosques. Why? Because, of course, as we know, in the Arab world, that is the uh, Mecca, the place where Mecca and Medina are. Okay? So they're, they were using the term, and then they stopped, and then they started using the term again as custodian of the two holy mosques. Okay? Well, how many kings... Seven, and then an eighth that comes from the seventh. Well, let's have a look at this. Here's Saudi Arabia. The youngest king, when he became king, was 51. Okay? There's the first king of Saudi Arabia. Okay? There's the second. There's the third. There's the fourth. There's the fifth. There's the sixth. There's the seventh. Okay? There's the seventh, and right now he's, what, about 87 years old, okay? He doesn't have much time left. He's the seventh. Who comes after him, brothers and sisters? You got it. Mohammed bin Salman, right, his son of the seventh, al Saad, and he's only 38. I think he's a little bit older now, but, or, or no, that would be 38. So he's 38 years old. He would be the eighth. And all of this is connected to the time frame and the location of Saudi Arabia. So we've got seven mountains. We've got seven actual kings. And then an eighth who comes from the seventh. I'm not saying it's crystal clear. But it looks pretty precise it looks pretty darn precise guys all right so these are things that that we've covered in part and we're, we're digging into it and showing more little nuggets along the way so for those that are newer and as a reminder to some because I, I love this part we showed how in luke and this is how you're going to be able to understand this timing of was, is not, and shall be, and at the same time, be able to understand that what Daniel is showing and what Revelation is telling us lines up with the differences in the Gospels, in, in particular, the discourses. When we go into Luke's discourse, which we know relates to that 40, 50-day period in the above, you see no mention of abomination of desolation because it's only the warning for them to flee because Jerusalem is going to be destroyed, as we covered earlier. And we see nothing about false Christs, 
or false prophets. And I, I mentioned this again recently, but I'm going to show, share it again because it is so powerful. When you understand that as it was in the beginning, so shall it be in the end, that the last will be first and the first will be last. Matthew, Mark, Luke in the end of days is Luke, Mark, Matthew. Pre-mid post. So in Luke, there was no mention in that portion called above, which is that 40, 50 day period. No mention of false Christ or false prophets. So what I'm pointing out with this is that in this period, there's no false Christ or false prophets on the scene. When were we showing he shows up? Right here, when it's that mid portion of seals that about two and a half years or so in after World War III has been taking place. When we go to Mark's discourse now, in chapter 13, we then see the first half, nation rise against nation. This is when Red Horse Rider starts. <clears throat> it's the first half of seals, about two and a half years. No mention of false Christs or false prophets. You want to know why? Because during all of that first two and a half years, as we've been showing, is World War III. The lion, the bear, and the leopard, before the fourth beast shows up on the scene and takes control over the lion, the leopard, and the bear. Before he becomes that eighth, which is of the seven. When that happens, that is the about two and a half years point. That is Revelation chapter 13 now begins at the 42 months. And what happens when he gets that power to continue for 42 months, what happens? He starts persecuting the saints, right? So what do they have to do? They have to flee. And what happens when they flee? Well, then we see that the false prophet shows up, the second beast of the earth. And when he shows up, he gets them all to worship the beast and to take the mark and everything else. So they're fleeing. So who should we see at this point? A mention of false Christ and false prophets. Hello. And then you've got the son of man coming. This is the end of six years of seals. This is the end of the 42 months. What do we know happens? At the end of the 42 months, Daniel chapter seven showed that the beast, the beast, the eighth, who is of the seven, he is the one that gets killed. And it's the Ezekiel 39 war, big battle and everything else. It's something we've also shown by going into second Esdras many times. But we know the false prophet wasn't killed, but the beast was killed. So now when you go to Matthew's discourse, which now starts trumpets, look at what we see in the first half of Matthew's discourse. False prophets. No false Christ mentioned in the first half of the seven years of trumpets because the beast has been killed, but we know the false prophet wasn't. So you just saw in the first half of, of Mark's discourse, which is the first half of the 14 years or about two and a half years, there was there was World War III with nation against nation and all those things. Then you see the abomination of desolation and the fleeing because now he gets his power. Now the false prophet comes on the scene there to worship him. It's the time of the mark of the beast and worshiping the beast. That's the was. Then he's killed, so he is not. And what do you see in the first half of Matthew's discourse, which is the seven years of trumpets? You see no false Christ because the beast has been killed. You only see false prophets. And then what happens? Now we get to the abomination of desolation. The first half of trumpets, the city in the streets with the temple was rebuilt while the Lord was here on Mount Zion. Remember, it was the Lord and it was Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel is responsible for rebuilding. Messiah is the high priest and king, and he's king shared between them with Zerubbabel. We're going to share that briefly as well. So now you get the abomination of desolation. 
This is now the mid-trumpets time that we were sharing earlier, 10 and a half years into tribulation, and now it's the cutoff. Now this is the time of the fleeing into the wilderness again, and this is the one from um, Revelation 12 and the one from Revelation 13. Uh, Revelation 12, sorry, Daniel 12 and Revelation 12, verse 14. And so what happens? At this abomination of desolation, this is after the temple was built. The one in Mark was the mark of the beast because the people are still the temple. It's still the Gentile age until the dividing of time. And after the dividing of time, it goes back to Judah's time and the temple was rebuilt. So this abomination is when the fifth trumpet happens, Satan is cast down, the pit is open, Antichrist comes back. Remember, he comes out of the pit. So when he comes out of the pit, who should be here again? Oh, there he is. False Christs and false prophets showing up on the scene again. You see how perfect that is? Was, is not, and shall be. But the was of the 42 months, the second half of seals, it's not the first half of seals because the first half is World War III, the lion, the bear, the leopard. He doesn't show up. The beast, the Antichrist, doesn't show up until after the time frame of World War III. We've been teaching this for a long time because the, the, the reason for him showing up when he comes is because the whole earth will be crying out for any savior to come. Except for those who in that first two and a half years of World War III, having seen tens of millions of people vanish, World War III break out all over the earth, it will be the greatest revival in human history. And at the was, which is the 42 months, is when they have to flee at Mark's time. The is not is the last year of seals and the first half of trumpets, and the shall be is the ten and a half year mid trumpets when the pit is opened at the fifth trumpet and the son of perdition comes back. You see, he doesn't show up until after the time of World War III. Look at this. Let me show you what it tells you about the Mahadi. Watch this. The reappearance. Before the, <clears throat> before the reappearance, listen to this. The world will plunge into chaos where immortality, uh, immorality and ignorance will be commonplace. The Quran will be forgotten and religion will be abandoned. There will be plagues, earthquakes, floods, wars, and death. Hello. When is he coming? He's not coming till after the time of what? Well, let's go look at Mark's discourse. <clears throat> Mark's discourse is even telling you this same period of time. What will happen? Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. That's the red horse rider. World War III breaking out, starting with Jerusalem. Earthquakes, famines. Troubles, which means what? Roiling of water. These are the beginnings of sorrows. This is the first two and a half years of seals. When does he show up? After these things. After the craziness of the first two and a half years of seals. Their own book is confirming this time frame. Their own book is confirming what the scriptures tell us that we've been able to reveal before we came to understand these things. This is always how it works here in this ministry. It is revealed by scripture, and then we come to find other things in apocryphas, in Muslim writings, that confirm and prove the exact same things within the periods we've shown from scripture. It says then, the, the Sufyani will rise and lead people astray. The Mahdi will then reappear in Mecca with the sword of Ali in his hand between the corner of Kaaba and station Abraham. So where is he? In Mecca. Where is he going to appear? 
in Mecca. What was in Mecca? The seven hills surrounding Mecca? The seven hills that are surrounding? And who is this Sufyani guy? Well, this guy, <clears throat> it would appear that this guy, who they call the tyrant, in their Islamic es uh, eschatology, I didn't get, they'd, some say they're not too sure if this guy really is, because it's kind of, some of them are a little bit twisted, but they believe in, in it's connected to uh, Islamic Syria. And what you have to remember is that there are Shia and Sunni. The Sunni are the Arabs generally. The Sunnis are in the south, and the Shia are in the north. And so the Sunni is where the beast is coming from. But he's going to be their leader. But it would seem that there's this Sufyani guy who is from the north, from the Shias, who is going to be the one causing this chaos all over the place. And they say, whether this guy is true or not, that his connection is Syria. Well, how fitting is that? How fitting is that? What do you think Syria, who is the lion as I showed you, who do you think that Muslims would rather go to and believe their leader is when they believe that their leader is the one who's going to destroy the Jews and remove them from their land? Hello. If the Jew, if Jerusalem is destroyed and the Jews flee, wouldn't it make sense that they would believe that Assad through Syria is going to be their Mahdi? But he won't be. It would seem he's prophesied to be this guy. So it won't be him. You see? But he's the one having destroyed Jerusalem and getting so much power and authority. And then what do we know happens? Him being one of the four beasts, the first one, who destroys Jerusalem, he's going to have power, he's going to have authority within his people. And when the Mahdi shows up in Mecca and they start realizing it's him, well, the Sufyani isn't going to be very pleased. And same with those that follow him. And he causes chaos. It's pretty wild. Now listen to this. By some accounts, so this is talking about the Mahdi now. By some accounts, he will appear on the day of Ashura, it, it always varies within their years um, because they follow the sun, right? Or sorry, the moons without the sun. Um, the day of the third imam, uh, on the day that the third imam was slain, he will be a young man of medium stature with a handsome face, with black hair and beard. A divine cry will call the people of the world to his aid after which the angels, or they call jinns, and humans will flock to the Mahdi. This is often followed shortly by another spiritual cry from the earth that invites men to join the enemies of the Mahdi, invites men to join the, the enemies of the Mahdi and would appeal to, diver, uh, um, to disbelievers and hypocrites. The Mahdi, listen to this, will then go to Kufa, which will become his capital. So he's going to take over the world. The world is going to turn to him. There's going to be a cry to come to him. But there was already, in the first two and a half years of seals, there was already the great multitude revival taking place. Not the great multitude rapture yet, but the greatest revival in human history taking place during the first portion of seals. So when he comes on the scene, and makes this call that the enemies and disbelievers and hypocrites and, and all those who have fallen from the, from the Quran because everything's been abandoned during World War III and the Christians were so depleted and defle deflated. Everybody is going to come to call to him except the true Christians. Except those who were part of the greatest revival. They're going to be the ones fleeing into the wilderness. Getting that special manna. And it just so happens. Who do you think, where do you think the time is of the manna? 
do you think maybe the time of the manna should be somewhere in here while they're fleeing into the wilderness? Well, let's see what Revelation chapter 2 says about those who will receive of the manna. Ta-da! Who, who are those who will get to eat of the hidden manna? It'll be those who flee right at the time of Pergamum, which is Mark's discourse fleeing into the wilderness time. Crazy, right? Crazy how much it makes sense. Why does he show up at this time? So that everybody will come to him is what the plan is because they will be so disillusioned. Remember what they said? Even that Christianity, they will be so disillusioned. This is what they're hoping for. This is the whole setup is to bring this about, to bring them on the scene. He is, he is the Lucifer picture. The one during the time of seals. Now look at what happens. As I said, he comes to Mecca. The first place he goes is Mecca, which is the city of seven hills. But it's not where he stays. It says the Mahdi will then go to Kufa and it will become his capital. Well, what on earth is Kufa? Remember what we're connecting it all to? Remember we're talking about Babylon and where ancient Babylon and where Babylon was? Now, am I saying this is exactly where it's going to be? No, but even theirs, even their writings saying this is where he's going after Mecca, that this will become his capital. Where is Kufa? You ready for this? Check it out. Kufa, okay? Here's Kufa. There's the Middle East. There's Saudi Arabia, right? Mecca and all that down in here. There's Israel. There's Jerusalem. Where is Kufa? Right here, brothers and sisters. This is Kufa. This is Kufa. Do you guys know where Babylon was? Let me show you where Babylon was. Modern day map of ancient Babylon. Okay? See this right here? Oops. There's Israel right here. There's Jerusalem. Here's Iraq. Okay? Babylonian Empire. There's Babylon. Where's Kufa? Like right here. Check that out. Right here. This was ancient Babylon. This is where they're claiming he's going to Kufa. There's Babylon. There's Kufa. Pretty crazy, right? And where does it say she sits? Now, I haven't looked to see if there's mountains. So I don't know. And this is why I'm saying I don't know if it's the mountains of Mecca where she sits or if she's actually sitting here, who is Mystery Babylon. Remember, Mystery Babylon is Babylon. And their writings are saying that he's going to go to ancient Babylon, like next door. It's like literally next door to Babylon. Right here. I thought that was pretty wild. Check this out. Here's a little side note for you guys. As I was telling you guys in the beginning, we, we had this group through Smyrna, right? This group called 14ers, 14ers, right? The original true Christians, the original true believers weren't called Christians. They were called 14ers. This is why I was telling you the Nazarim, the Nazarene, who Christ was. These are the watchmen. They were called 14ers. We've talked about this many times. And it just so happened we were calling ourselves 14ers because of the revelation of the years. And then we come to find out that there were ancient 14ers. Well, guess what? Do you know that, that Essenes who were 14ers, what were they? They were an, they were an, apple, uh, an apocalyptic sect, remember? The Essenes were apocalyptic. 
they were looking to the end of days. And we know what it connected to because they were at the end of days of the was looking at the is when Christ was coming as the end of days. But there was really a prophetic typology in them who we are a part of today, who are an apocalyptic set called 14ers who are watching for the coming of the Lord as the watchman for the end of days. An apocalyptic sect. Essenes. Nazarenes. 14ers. Well, remember I told you the enemy had their group too? Check this out. They call themselves 12ers. They call themselves 12ers. What? We've got an opposite force of enemies against us who are called 12ers. And the 12ers are the Muslim apocalyptic group <laughs> who are watching for their Mahdi and watching for their seasons and times for the coming of their Mahdi. And they call themselves 12ers. And then we've got an end of days on Christ's side who are called 14ers, who are an apocalyptic group. Craziness, right? I wanted to just throw that in there as a little side note. I couldn't believe it. I think I caught it a while back, but I don't know, like years ago. And I don't know if we were 14ers yet. I certainly didn't know that there were 14ers in history that were a typology because what was shall be. You see, all of this was, is, is to come. It's all replaying in typologies. The whole thing is replaying in typologies. Well, let's keep going because we still got the goodies coming. All right. So we showed this connection. We were talking about this connection, as I said, I would continue in relation to the bottomless pit so that people can see and understand for themselves this connection to when the bottomless pit is opened. We see it right here at the sound of the fifth angel, a star, uh, a star fall from heaven to the earth who was given the key to the bottomless pit. And the bottomless pit was open. Okay? So we see all these things and all this. This is about ten and a half years into tribulation or about mid trumpets time. Midway through the seven years of trumpets. This is the point. This right here is the time of Matthew 24. And they're fleeing to the mountains. They're fleeing to the wilderness. This is the time after the city and the streets and the temple had been rebuilt. This is precisely, for those that don't know it, Daniel 9, right here, Daniel 9, 26, when it says, after three score and two weeks, so after about two, uh, three and a half years, which is mid-trumpets, Messiah Shall Messiah be cut off? Not for himself, but for the people of the prince that shall come. Shall destroy the city and sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with a flood. Unto the end of the war. Which means there's also going to be a war. And unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. That means this is going to last from the cutting off. This is going to last two and a half years. And then there's still one more year. Hello. So for those that have been around for a while, you'll know that the two and a half of the final three and a half are, of course, Daniel 9, 9 uh, sorry, Daniel 12, verse 7. How long will it be? And the angel tells him for a time, comma, times, comma, and a half. That means one, no and, so there's no addition. One, two, and means plus a half. That's two and a half years to scatter the power of the holy people and all things shall be finished. So. This is to the end of the, the flood and to the end of the war, desolations are determined of Daniel 9, 26, which means there's still one more year left in the 14 years. There's still one final year left in uh, uh, the final three and a half years because that only accounted for two and a half years. Well, look what happens here. When Satan is cast down, you see, 
when Satan, having lost his battle in heaven against Michael and his angels, which lasted for the first half of trumpets, which is about 1260 days, we see Satan is cast down. We know the pit is open. He has great wrath. And what does he do? He's going to go after the woman. They're going to, she's going to fly on the way on the wings of a great eagle into the wilderness, into her place where she's nursed for a time, comma, and times, comma, and a half. That's one plus two plus a half. So the woman is going to fly away at mid trumpets for all of the final three and a half years of tribulation. But Satan's time is only going to last two and a half of those three and a half years. And who's there? Well, Antichrist, right? The beast is brought back. False prophet is still there. And now the dragon Satan is there. So at mid trumpets, it's going to be even worse than it was at that mid seals point. And what does he do? He's going to go after her with a flood. It's going to be swallowed up. And then what is he going to do? He's going to make war with the remnant of the seed, which we know from Revelation 11 is when the 1260 days are over, right? Which is the, the time of the two witnesses. Look at what it says. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth, okay? Look what happens. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, that means, right, was, is, and shall be. Here's your shall be time. What does he do? He's going to make war against them, kill them, right? Overcome and kill them. Well, this is to the end of what? To the end of the sixth trumpet. That means that this war takes two and a half years, and we saw in Revelation 12 that he goes after them with a flood. So for those that didn't know it, Daniel 9.26 is the mid-trumpets point. You had seven weeks, which are seals, not discussed. These are seven years that already happened, which are the seven years of seals. Then you get, see, comma and, which means plus the about three and a half years of trumpets. Messiah was here for those three and a half years. And then the city and the streets were being rebuilt in the wall. And then this part here, at the cutoff to the flood, you see, he's going to go after them with a flood. And then there's going to be a war against the two witnesses. And it's going to last for two and a half years, leaving one year, which is when Messiah returns feet down. And this is the part we're going to get to in a moment. But I want you guys to understand, it said that it was the, the two witnesses, the, the two olive branches. Well, who are they? For those that don't know this, this is going to shock you. And I'm bringing this up because of our brother, uh, Olu, who's been so excited uh, seeing all these revelations. Watch this. In Zechariah chapter 4, we're told, right? The two olive trees, okay? We're told who they are. Listen to what it says. Who art thou, O great mountain before Zerubbabel? Who's Zerubbabel? The hands of Zerubbabel are the one who is laying the foundation during the time of seals. So he's part of the group that will go back into Jerusalem, and he's in charge of overseeing the rebuilding of the temple, of which they're only, as I said, during seals, going to get the temple foundation laid, and that's it. Look at what it says. And Anson said, what are these two to all of branches of the right of the candlestick? And the two olive branches, uh, these are two olive trees and the two olive branches. And then uh, Zechariah 4.14 then says, then said he, these are the two anointed ones. So now go to Zechariah chapter six. Who are the two anointed ones? Check this out. Starting in verse 10. And take them of the captivity of Haggai, da, 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 which come from Babylon, see, which come from Babylon because Babylon is still in the scene and come thou the same day and go to the house of Josiah, the king, uh, uh, the son of Zephaniah, then take silver and gold, listen to this, and make crowns, plural, and set them upon the head of Joshua. 
Who is the prophetic typology of Joshua, brothers and sisters? Jesus. Yeshua. Okay? Everybody knows he's the prophetic typology. He is a typology of Christ. And who is he? <clears throat> High priest. So we know when Christ comes at the end of seals to start trumpets, he is going to be high priest and king like uh, um, Melchizedek. But listen to what it says. I want you to remember this. We're going to get to this in a second. They're making crowns for Yeshua. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he will grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Who's building the temple of the Lord? The high priest Joshua? Nope. Who's the one building the temple? The one who laid the foundation. The Lord told you in Zechariah 4 that the one who laid the foundation was Zerubbabel. And that Zerubbabel is going to be the one to finish it. Listen to what it says. This is like chapter 6. This is like the sixth year of seals in chapters to years of Zechariah, for those that were wondering. It says, um, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory and sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Hello. The council shall be between them both. Between them both. What, what did it say about both? The two olive trees, of which Zerubbabel was the one of the branch, and what? They're the two anointed ones, and there's two of them that are going to be ruling between the two of them in the rebuilding of Jerusalem. And who's the one who has plural crowns yeshua does which means joshua yeshua jesus who's the high priest and king who's going to be there with uh, uh the modern day zerubbabel who laid the foundation and is going to complete the building of the temple in the first half of trumpets well yeshua messiah is there on mount zion as also as high priest and also king they're the two witnesses so look at what happens. They are the two witnesses. And they're there for what? The first half of trumpets, it said. They're there for the first half of trumpets doing their thing. Rebuilding the temple, the overseeing and the rebuilding of the temple. And the other one as high priest and king, who is the Melchizedek type. And he's leading the 144,000. Now watch what happens. How can we prove this? Well, let me show you. If you guys remember, we saw in Luke chapter 11, we've explained how the Son of Man hadn't fulfilled, we were saying at the beginning, the sign of Jonah in Luke, Mark, and Matthew. He did not become the 40 days Son of Man as Jonah was because Jonah warned for 40 days. Jesus did not turn around and warn for 40 days from his resurrection. When you go to Mark, and we know that this is what's happening, as we said earlier, during the 50 days before the 14 years begin. That's why it's in Luke. When you go to Mark, in Mark, I think, chapter 8, we see they demand a sign, and listen to what it says. And they sigh deeply, uh, this generation seeks after a sign. Verily I say unto you, there shall no sign be given this generation. And he entered the ship and he left. That sounds nothing. This is one of those differences in the Gospels that really messes people up and say, see, this is a clear contradiction, because it is, unless you understand it prophetically. Mark gets no sign. They don't know when the great multitude rapture is going to happen. They will have seen him come at the end of the six years of seals in that Ezekiel 39 war. But as we've said, the great multitude rapture doesn't happen as soon as he comes on heavenly Mount Zion. It won't happen for a few months. So they get no sign. Well, what happens when you go to Matthew? In Matthew, 
This is where it gets very crazy. The sign of Jonah in Matthew that Jesus has yet to fulfill, it says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. You've all been told that three days and three nights means any part of a day or another day. And so if it was part of one, one whole day and part of another, then that means three days and three nights. No, it doesn't. You've been lied to, but probably unawares that they were lying to you because they just didn't yet understand. So instead of saying we can't really reconcile, we're not quite sure, they just tell you that's how it works. No, it says three days and three nights. It's letting you know that he was in the heart of the earth for a full three days and a full three nights, which means that he's going to resurrect. He's going to come out of the heart of the earth sometime on the fourth day. Well, that's impossible to have happened according to scripture because we read that the resurrection was on the third day, right? And the third day rise again. And it didn't even count for how many days he was in the grave because it counted from when he was taken into the hands of sinful men, then crucified, and then resurrected on the third day. He was only in the grave for about a, a day and a half. He did not yet fulfill the story of Jonah in Luke, Mark, or Matthew because it's prophecy. And as you just saw, that he is one of the two witnesses. Then you go to Revelation 11. And you see that there's war against the two witnesses that I just showed you is going to last for two and a half years. And then they're going to be killed. Who are the two witnesses? Modern day Zerubbabel and Joshua Yeshua. The high priest and king and the king who rebuilt it. who are going to rule between them both. And look at how long they're there. Three days and a half. How do you get to three days and a half? Three full days, three days, three nights, which means sometime on the fourth day, they resurrect. Do you realize the only one that hasn't been fulfilled or the one out of all of it, nobody was able, ever able to reconcile that he resurrected on the third day. He was only in the grave for about a day and a half. And yet, the story of, of Jonah in Matthew, he, he had to be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights, meaning he had to resurrect sometime on the fourth day. It doesn't compute. And that's because the world doesn't know that Messiah is going to do it again, but he's not doing it for the sins of the world. He's doing it because some of his servants, I believe of the 144,000, during the time of trumpets, are going to fall away. This is why in Matthew chapter 24, in his discourse, it talks about the servants. You see, coming of the Son of Man, it'll be as the days of Noah, that final year. And look at what it says. In Matthew 24, 42, Watch therefore, for you know not the hour that the Lord cometh, but know this, that if the good man of the house had known in which watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such a time you think not the Son of Man cometh. Um, who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall make him rule over his household and give him meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord will... When he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. Now listen to this. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delays his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and to drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an, hour, in an hour when he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites, and there shall be 
weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, some servants are going to fall away. But you have to understand the 144,000, what were they? The 144,000 were sealed with the Father's name on their forehead. They can't be left. Who are they? They are the priestly line. They're the priestly line. And so those that don't know it, remember, Jesus is the Melchizedek, who is the greater than Aaron. And the priestly line has their own sacrifice. It is the burnt offering atonement of the bull. Leviticus chapter 1 has the bull, has the lamb, and has the two turtle doves. So if the beginning is last and the last is first, you add Christ at his birth, the two turtle doves. You add Christ as the male lamb without blemish at his death and resurrection. Salvation for all sin for all of us. But what was missing or what's still not accomplished? The burnt offering atonement of the bull. And who is the bull? Christ. He is the beginning and the end. The alpha. The Aleph, Taurus, the ox. He is the beginning and the end. So even though it sucks that I, I don't I didn't really want to go too far down this, but I wanted you guys to see it is there in scripture. And Messiah doing this is doing it for the 144,000 for the atonement for some of them, for the atonement of a priestly portion line. To account for Aaron's fall and him striking the rock, which accounted for the second strike in Numbers chapter 20, when Moses struck it twice. Once was accounted for him, which was the salvation of sin as the lamb, and the second one was related to Aaron, and it hasn't been fulfilled yet. And according to Matthew, you saw that it was three days and three nights, which means sometime on the fourth day. And there's only one time in Scripture where sometime on the fourth day, there's a resurrection taking place. This brings us to the end of the 13 years of tribulation. What happens at this point? In the same hour, there's a great earthquake. Why? Poof. They went up, remember? Then they stood up after three and a half days. In the same hour, there was a great earthquake. What happens when you go to Matthew's resurrection story? Only in Matthew's resurrection story out of all of them, there was a great earthquake. And the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. And we see in his countenance was like lightning and his raiment was white as snow. You see, now this is his return, feet down on the Mount of Olives. Okay? So you guys are following that. You can see what's taking place. You're understanding this differences within time. Well, remember what I told you about crowns? That in uh, Zechariah chapter 6, that Yeshua Joshua was given many crowns? Well, look what happens in Revelation chapter 19 when the Lord is going to return feet down on the Mount of Olives, or after he's returned, I should say, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and this is going to be, oh, wait until we get into this, brothers and sisters, this is about to blow your mind. We know that this war here, this battle, listen to what it says. This is the one when he comes in the great winepress of the wrath of God, okay? Of Almighty God. What does it say about him? It says, and I saw uh, heaven open and the white horse, him that was faithful uh, and righteous, judge and make war. His eyes were as the flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And on his head were many crowns. It just so happened at the beginning, at the end of seals to the beginning of trumpets, he was made many crowns. Many crowns were given to him. He ruled and reigned 
as high priest and king, as the Melchizedek type, greater than the order of Aaron. And he shared it with, in part, as you could say, with Zerubbabel, who was doing the rebuilding of the temple and the overseeing of it. They get killed. They're resurrected. And the Lord is returning. And at some point in the 14th year, at this battle, you see him coming with many crowns. This is purposeful, guys. Where do you see Christ? Messiah, Yeshua, get many crowns in the prophetic revelation of Zechariah chapter 6. That's why when he returns, now he has all of his crowns. They're not going anywhere, okay? Now let's keep going because this is going to start to get crazy good for you. Okay, we covered that. Revelation 11 got that. All right. Now we come to Revelation chapter 18. Listen to what this says in Revelation 18. Um, after these things, I saw the earth. Okay, watch this. And after these things, verse 1, I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power, and the earth was lighted with lightened with his glory. Sounds similar, right, to, to Matthew 28? And he cried with a mighty strong voice, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become a habitation of devils of every foul spirit and hateful bird. Okay? Which is interesting, because when you go to Isaiah and Jeremiah, it even tells you that these birds are also uh, owls. So isn't it interesting, right, that the enemies, right, through Albert Pike and all those guys, they use the owl. Now listen to this. Check this out. For all nations have, have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Very important. All nations have drunk. Okay? And it says, and the king's of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants which waxed great uh, 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 which waxed rich through her abundance of her delicacies look at this luxury luxury sounds like uh, Saudi Arabia as well if you say luxury to anybody on earth they will all tell you Saudi Arabia and I heard another voice from heaven cry out come out of her okay so you're seeing what had to happen was what? They had to be made drunk with the wine of her, uh, uh, with the, drunk from the wine of the wrath, right? Watch this. In Jeremiah chapter 25, what do we see happen at the end of 70 years? Okay? Jeremiah 25, 12. We've spoken about this before. And when 70 years are accomplished, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, okay? For the iniquity and the land of the Chaldees will I make a, it perpetual desolation. What are we seeing here? At the end of 70 years, Babylon is destroyed. So the first thing to get destroyed is Babylon. But then what happens? Look what happens. In verse 15, it says, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel unto me, take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. Babylon is destroyed first <clears throat> and all of those nations are now to drink of the wine of the wrath from the cup of the Lord for the abominations that they took part with with Babylon the Great. And he makes all the nations to drink. Hello? 
But what did he say he would do first? When 70 years are accomplished, he's going to punish and destroy Babylon. It's going to begin the 14th year at the completion of 70 years. So if we've understood this correctly in our chart, and we see the count from when they captured the rest of Jerusalem, and we come to the end of 70 years, which is Elul 29 of 2037, okay? Which means we're in the seventh year of a cycle right now. And we're in the 70th, as we said before, from when they first got the first portion of Jerusalem with the count of Leviticus, 23, uh, Leviticus 19, which means the 14 years, there's 50 days, of course, that come first. And then at Feast of Trumpets 2024 would begin the 14 years and the attack on Jerusalem by the lion Syria that will flee them out of the land like Luke 21 warned about. And then what? The end of 13 years. At the end of 13 years, it will be the end of 70. Okay? This is what we've been showing. It's the end of 70. What do we know happens when the 70 years are accomplished in the prophetic typology in this picture? Babylon is destroyed. Do you know that Babylon is destroyed in perpetual desolations before all the nations that were made to drink go to war? I bet you you didn't see that one yet. So what do we know happens? 2037, if it's the count from when they got the rest of Jerusalem, that means... At Elul 29, 2037, and Feast of Trumpets 2037, this is where, when 70 years are complete, day one begins the final year, the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance. What does it start with? The destruction of Babylon when the 70 years are accomplished. So let's, let's go back. Let's go back now to chapter 18. And listen to what it says. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, is become the habitation. Remember, he's going to now make it desolate. Okay? And what do we still have? For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath. They made themselves rich through the luxury, which again to me sounds like, uh, like uh, uh, um, Saudi Arabia. And another voice, listen to this, and I heard a voice, okay? So Babylon has fallen, and I heard a voice come out from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, and be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. That you receive not of her plagues. So see, it's, it's, he's crying out, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, but it, it hasn't taken place yet. It's about to take place. Remember what's going to happen to Babylon. Babylon is going to be destroyed in a single day. But it says that it's going to be with plagues. And it says, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquity, her iniquities. You see, if she was already officially destroyed, why would there be a warning? You see, you could say she's destroyed, but now it's telling you the story. So what do you see? Come out of her and take not take do not take part of her plagues. For her sins have reached heaven and God has remembered her. Listen to this. Reward her even as she rewarded you and double unto her, double according to her works. In the cup which she hath filled, fill unto her double. So much as she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously to what be luxurious be luxurious sorry my screen's popping up in front of me so you have luxury and be luxurious 
two things directly associated with Saudi Arabia. For much torment and sorrow giver, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and I am no widow, and I shall see no sorrow. Therefore, listen to this, shall her plagues come in one day. Her plagues will come in one day. When do they come, according to the was? At the accomplishment of 70 years. So at the beginning time frame of that 14th year of tribulation, do you guys remember what we've talked about when it came to the plagues, when it came to the, to the bulls, the vile judgments? I've always said, and the reason I don't talk about them much is because they're a very short period of time. I don't know if they're a week, uh, a few weeks. I didn't know. But when you see their devastation, they're a very short period of time. All right? Well, now you're about to see it. And you're going to about to see the timing. Because when the 70 years are over, Babylon is destroyed. And it says that Babylon is destroyed. But what happens? When Babylon is destroyed, the nations weren't part of it, were they? The nations weren't part of it, according to Revelation. They watched it happen to her. It says, For she saith in her heart, I said in no sorrow, therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire. For strong is the Lord God that judges her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously, there it is again, only used two times, live deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning. Standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. You see that? In one hour. She was part of purple. She was part of scarlet. In one hour, she is destroyed with what? With plagues. In one hour, it begins. And within a day, all of the plagues are poured out on that great city. But who? Is not there with her. The nations. The nations weren't there. The nations were watching. They were watching her. Get destroyed by plagues. In one day. Who else still has to be here? Well Satan has to be here. The false prophet. The beast, the Antichrist, right? Those three still have to be here. But apparently, they're not going to be in Babylon. So whether Babylon is that place in Iraq or whether it's in Saudi Arabia, it's going to be what gets destroyed first. But remember, if it gets destroyed first, what happens to the nations? Well, the nations are the ones that had to drink the wine. And they drank of the wine. And after they drank of the wine, look what happens, right? For all nations have drunk. We saw at the end of 70, Babylon is about to be destroyed, but all the nations had to be given the drink of wine. And then what happens? Then Babylon gets destroyed. But all of those nations who took of that drink are not there. They're all watching 
what is taking place upon her, which are what? The plagues that will come in one day. This is everything we're reading here. Remember, Babylon, they're going to be singing, dancing, they're, they're, because it's going to be Babylon. I'm not saying it's for sure going to be that place where ancient Babylon was, right, in Kufa. That's where their prophecies are saying it's going to be, which is right next to Babylon. It kind of makes sense. It could certainly make sense. But it may also be that it's going to be around Mecca or somewhere, you know, in Saudi Arabia. But if it, it's still connected because he's coming from Saudi Arabia. And that's where his headquarters is going to be. But he's not going to be there. The false prophet, the beast Antichrist, and Satan aren't actually going to be wherever this Babylon is when it's destroyed. Okay? Watch what happens. Or maybe I should reword that. They might be there, but something is going to happen with them. Okay? You can see this. I want you to grasp this. Watch it again if you have to. The key to start understanding this was that Babylon the Great is destroyed after they've drinking the wine of wrath. And we saw in Jeremiah 25 that when the 70 years are done, the destruction of Babylon is coming, but that these nations were to be given to drink of the wine of the wrath. Here, they're now, they've drunk it. And Babylon is about to be destroyed. See, is fallen, is fallen. It's not that it's actually fallen yet. It's that it's about to fall because the sins have reached God and he is now remembered. And he's now about to bring it upon her. And what he is bringing upon her are the plagues which will come in one day, death, mourning, famine, and being burned. Are you ready for this? Revelation 16. Verse 1. The bowls of wrath, right? And I saw the seven angels uh, go, uh, go your ways and pour out the seven vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out the vial and grievous sores came uh, sores upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshipped his image. The second poured it upon the sea. You see that? Upon the sea. Not seas, right? Upon the sea. And it became as blood of dead men, and everything, every living soul in the sea died. Uh, the third poured it out upon the rivers and upon the fountains of waters. Yes, in, as you're going to see, in Babylon. And they became blood. So you're seeing that grievous sores come upon them. You're seeing that that um, uh, blood, water being turned to blood in the sea, water being blood, turned to blood in the fresh waters, and they're being given blood to drink. All of this is happening quickly. Uh, the fourth angel, power was given unto him to scorch men with fire, okay? And they still repented not. The fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seed of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness. Okay, so what are we seeing? So yes, the beast is there. So you're going to see that the beast is there, the false prophet and the antichrist are there, but something is going to happen. And they blasphemed the God of heaven because of the pains and sores, and they repented not of their deeds. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof dried up. The great river what? Euphrates. Well, is it possible that maybe this is the area where it's actually going to be? I want you to realize something. These are all being poured out in one day. I told you in the past, I believed that they were a very short period of time. So we didn't spend too much time in it because it was such a short period of time. You see what's going on? 
These are the plagues being poured out upon Babylon. You see, that's why where his seed is, his seed is going to be in Babylon. And I saw three unclean, unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the beast, and out of the false prophet. So there all three of them are. <laughs> but what happens? These spirits, like devils, where do they go? See? For, there are, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth into the kings of the earth. And of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of almighty God. Are you catching it? Who's not taking part in this? Who's not taking part? The kings of the earth and the nations of the world. If the kings that drank of the wine of the wrath. It, it seemed when reading these in the past that these were things falling upon the whole earth. They're not. It says it right here. Why else would you have the spirit come out of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet that all three of these spirits are going into the kings of the earth and of the whole world to bring them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty? Because they're not taking part in it. This, these vials are the punishment falling upon Babylon that come in one day, falling upon great Babylon in one day. And the nations that partook of these things with Babylon are still outside of it, seeing what has happened and is happening in that day to Babylon when the vials are poured out. This is why you could see those three spirits going into the kings of the earth and of the nations. This is why you're seeing them watch what's taking place. Babylon is dealt with first with the vials. This is the destruction of Babylon and those who are in Babylon that refused to get out. You see, because in, 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 in chapter 18, it says, come out of her. Why would the Lord say, come out of her, my people? Because there were probably people in Babylon trying to save people. Like maybe some of the 144,000. Remember the 144,000 at mid-trumpets, before Messiah is cut off and that whole mid-trumpets portion begins, the 144,000 are given greater power so they're not hurt. They can't die. <laughs> they have all these greater abilities given to them and protection. And they're going to be gathered to what? To the great day of battle of God Almighty. Which means that the bulls are poured out at the beginning of the 14 years. They're poured out on Babylon only in one day. And these nations that were taking part in all of their, their, their luxuries are now witnessing this happen to Babylon with the plagues poured out on her in one day. And look at what it says. In Revelation 16, verse 5, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keep his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Precisely as it ends in the Laodicean age, as he says, even right here in verse 18, that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Hello. It is 100% directly connected to the end portion of the Laodicean age from when the pit is opened to the end of the 13th and the start of the 14th year. All of that portion, that final half of trumpets is the Laodicean age. And the bulls 
are the judgment that are poured upon Babylon. And you could totally now see it by understanding why these spirits like frogs are coming out of the three to go into the kings of the earth and why in Revelation 18, the kings of the earth are watching what is happening to her because they're witnessing the bowls being poured out in one day on Babylon. We got it. This is it. And look at what happens at the seventh bowl. Listen to what it says. Revelation 16, 17, just to put the nail in it. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings. And there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. Listen to this. And the great city was divided into three parts and the cities of the nations fell and great Babylon came into remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Brothers and sisters, this is the beginning of the 14th year, which will be the vials on Babylon in one day. And so now, when we see this in Revelation 18, that Babylon is being destroyed, that the nations that drank of the wine of the wrath, now that they have drunk it, they're witnessing the destruction of Babylon and standing in awe, seeing it happen in one hour, take place in one day. All of the destruction of Babylon is completed. And what happens? Those nations who had to drink of the wine haven't yet had their day in court, if you will. What were they being told to be brought to? Revelation chapter 6, uh, chapter 16, told us that when those three spirits went out of the three of them, they went into the nations to what? Bring them to the great day of Almighty God. What is the day of the Lord, which is the year of his vengeance? Well, that now takes us to Revelation 19. Listen to what we read. And after these things, I heard a voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation, glory, and honor, and power to our Lord God, unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. This is Babylon, guys. This isn't going to be Rome. It's Arab. It's Muslim. So what do we see? Babylon has been judged. Babylon has been dealt with in one day with the bold judgments. And now look at what happens. Verse 3. And again they say, Hallelujah. Her smoke rose up forever and ever. And the 24 and the 4 and 20 elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his people, his servants, ye that fear him, both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a multitude, right? They're in paradise, of a great multitude, and the voice of many waters and the voice of many thunders saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, omnipotent reigns now listen to this for the marriage of the lamb is come the wife has made herself ready okay we're talking about towards the end we're, we're in the 14th year remember what happens this is that 14th year the lamb has made herself ready which means the end of the 14th year is coming remember the final 14th year is as it was in the days of noah 
That's the Bulls. It starts with the Bulls in that one day. And then all of those nations that had to drink of the wine of the wrath were now told to go and assemble to the day of God for the wrath of God, right? So now what do we see? We see Babylon has been destroyed in that one day with the bold judgments. And all of the nations who are left, who took part in her, in her riches, are now being told to gather, to go against God in the final battle. And listen to what happens. The bride is ready. The time of the marriage is, is at hand. This is not the Gentile bride. This is the Jewish bride. This is the, the, the pre-trib was the Gentile bride. This is the post-trib bride. But it's not quite yet. She's made herself ready. It's about to happen. But now listen to what happens in Revelation 19, verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called uh, faithful and true. And in righteousness, he does judge and make war. And his eyes were as a flame of fire. And on his head, there he is, right? Many crowns. Um, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And listen to this. He was clothed with a vestiture dipped in blood. And his name is called the word of God. Now, why is this important? Look at this vestiture dipped in blood. Ready for this? Uh, where am I? Da -da 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 -da. Vestiture dipped in blood. Jeremiah, no, Genesis. Genesis 49, listen to this. Remember this? Look at what it says. Okay, this is when Jacob blesses his sons. And look at what verse and verse one ends with. Uh, halfway through. That I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. In the last days. It's literally at the end of time. At the end of days, what will befall you? Here we are talking about the end of days. And when the Lord comes, what is he connected to? Judah. Remember, in the end of days, he's saving Judah. And what do we see about Judah? Listen to this. 49 verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh, peace, right? Messiah, epitaph for Messiah, until Messiah come. And unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his fowl unto the vine, and his ass is colt unto the choice vine. Okay, what is it? A vine, especially the grape, and this one to the choice vine which is the vine stalk, but also the grapes, okay? He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. There's his garment, which is what? A vestiture. There's his clothes, which is clothing, which is, look at this, which is covering because it's as the veil, because what happens at the end of tribulation? The veil is removed. When the veil is removed, brothers and sisters, it is the end of tribulation. What happened with the days of Noah? At the end of the days of Noah, at the end, which is like the end of the 14 years, the veil is removed. There's your picture. He has his garments and clothing, and look at what his garments are. His garments are also called his vestiture. So he has a vestiture in wine dipped in blood, right? Look what happens when you go to Revelation 19, which is a picture of the end of the 14 years when all the nations after Babylon has been destroyed, when the 70 years were done, they had drunk in the wine. The spirit of the three goes into all the nation's leaders and they gather themselves together to come and fight against them at the time frame of about the end of the 14th year. And here comes the Lord ready to fight against them, and his what? His vesture dipped in blood, which is the wine, the vesture dipped in blood, which is the blood like wine. And it says, and the armies which were in heaven followed him, and upon the white horses clothed in, uh, in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. The ones who had drunk the wine after Babylon was destroyed 
who had to be given it before she was attacked and they were given it. Then she was destroyed in one day by the by the 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 vial, the bold judgments. Now these nations are being gathered together. And they're about to be destroyed. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of almighty God. And he hath on his vestiture and on his thigh the name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And then what happens? <laughs> we know the fowls gathered to the great supper of God. They're going to eat all the flesh of all the those that were killed and the beasts and, and the horses and everything. And listen to this. See, <laughs> of the flesh of all men, both free and bond, small and great. This is this is exactly what you read, remember? When you go back to Jeremiah 25, after that battle, and he says that there will be people, there will be people dead on all over the place throughout the earth, and none will bury them. They're gonna, these animals, they will creatures will come and feast on the fowls will come and feast on all of them until the Lord renews everything, right? And I saw the beast. And the kings of the earth. You see? So what happened? That spirit from the beast went out. And the spirit of, of Satan and the spirit from the false prophet went out to gather those kings. See? And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And look what happens. Bam! The beast was taken. And with them, the false prophet that brought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark and everything else. You see that? Brothers and sisters, we can now follow and track and understand so much more going from 15 into 16 into 17. The woman is Babylon, is that great city. Whether it's going to be near ancient Babylon or whether it's going to be in Saudi Arabia, the beast is the Antichrist. The beast and the false prophet working together, they are two people with the Mahdi and their prophet coming. It has already been spoken about. It is in scripture. It is, it is spoken about in the letter of the Third World War. They didn't know what we know. That only brings them to mid seals or two, excuse me, about mid seals, right? About two and a half years. We can now take this sucker to the end with so much more clarity. We can see that this woman, which is Babylon, is sitting on the seven heads and ten horns. We could see when her destruction comes is at the end of 70 years. We can now line up clearly. Jeremiah 25, as we've been showing, and that final year of the Lord that will begin after 70 years, them having drunk the wine of those nations, and then Babylon being destroyed by the bulls in one day. I want you to understand it. I hope you guys are getting it. In one day, Babylon is destroyed. Mystery Babylon, the woman, is destroyed. In one day, by the bull judgments. But the nations that took part in it all are not there. They are seeing it happen to her, to that great city. And when the bull judgments are over, these nations will gather together. I mean, that's probably going to take some time. They're going to be gathering together while well, all of this chaos is taking place in this final year because it'll be as it was in the days of Noah. Now you can see, now we can understand why when the two witnesses are killed, it says they celebrate and give gifts, I think it says, right? That's in Babylon. That's in Babylon. Babylon receives the vials the judgments of the bulls in one day. And the nations who were watching, who took part, 
as I end it with this, repeating it again so that you grasp it. They are then watching Babylon be destroyed at the beginning time frame of the 14 years of the 14th year when the 70th is accomplished it happens in one day the bull judgments are one day and then those nations that were a part of her witnessing what's happening will be gathered together because of the spirit that was in Satan and in the beast and in the false prophet will go into all of them after they have drunk of the wine. That the Lord made that one that Jeremiah said that they had to drink of it. And when they do, they will gather themselves together after Babylon has been destroyed and will take part in the great wine press of the wrath of God. Oh, my Lord. I knew this was going to happen. I've been telling you guys for the past two, three, four months, we will continue to get greater and greater depth of revelation as we have never had before. Now, I say as we've never had before. We have had incredible, incredible hundreds of, of prophetic revelations of the was and the is revealing the is to come like no other ministry on the history of the earth. And it said it would happen. It had to happen before the end could begin. And something that had bothered me for so long was the time of the bulls, but also 17, 18, and even part of 19, how that all fit in with Babylon and its destruction. Yet yet the nations that weren't taking part in, in all of it, it was still convoluted. Not anymore. And as we continue to grow, as we continue to move forward, I know the Spirit will reveal more in Christ Jesus, in the will of the Father who says, make it known, and the Spirit will guide us and lead us, and greater and greater clarity will continue and continue to be made known. And like I said, like everything else, as it comes to be revealed, and it's the first time, it will get more clear and more clear. And it'll become part of the revelation. It will just become part of the understanding like it's no big deal. But at first, I'm sure you guys are like, wait, what? What about this? What about this? Promise you, follow it again. Follow it through. Take your time. Study the word. Like I said in the beginning, it is each and everyone's responsibility to diligently seek the Lord out yourselves. And I promise you, when you do, like everybody else in this ministry and every other revelation that they have come to understand, this will also be clear to you, just like the eight mountains, the seventh to the eighth. Follow from there. Watch them forward. Diligently seek it. And brothers and sisters, I pray this blesses you as it has blessed me. I pray you receive it and seek it and search it. And if you can, support the ministry and help us bring Uganda into the finish line. Brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. God bless your families. We will talk to you all soon. Bye for now.